Hi, I'm here to read this piece by John Bois, 17776, What Football Will Look Like in the Future. John Bois is a sports writer for SBNation.com, and usually he makes this incredible video content, um, which I have this playlist of here, and uh, I am someone who does not care about sports. I probably watch like between zero and one games of any sport per year, depending on whether I'm dragged to a baseball game. I don't know which teams go with which cities or who the players are, what the rivalries are, and um, say like, I don't know the rules of football, but his video on a 222 to nothing college football game is still interesting and with this incredible editing style because John Bois views sports as athletes have gotten together for hundreds of thousands of games over decades and centuries and um, with that much these interesting stories and anomalies are bound to happen and say like here's here's one video that he had made on uh, him charting every single score in an NFL game uh, and Scores that have never been made before, right? And so, as of today is November 30th. As of November 30th, there have been five scores nominated this year. So here's where we are. Opportunities are scarce. There are some vacancies in the 32 point column that look kind of like a Tetris block with a rapid fire laser cannon. There are weird, lonely, unscratched voyages like 25 to 18, 20 to 11, 14 to 8. There are vast, uncharted territories in the scoring Arctic, reachable only if one or both teams score tons of points. But even that is less remote than the Four Point Canyon. Aside from that single 10-4 game from 1923, no team has ever finished with four points. Uh, so John Bois videos are incredibly mundane and yet somehow very interesting and with detailed editing and graphs and super watchable. Uh, yesterday he came out with the second part of what is literally a 90-minute documentary on athletes named Bob, which I sat down and watched the whole way through and is honestly incredible. Because, again, when athletes get together for tens of hundreds of thousands of games over decades and centuries, interesting things will happen even if you are Taking a sample of history, which is just all of the athletes named Bob, he will find interesting stories to talk about and edit them together in a captivating way. And even if you don't care about sports, they are interesting videos. Actually, even if you don't care for these videos or you don't care about sports in that sense, uh, 17776, What Football Will Look Like in the Future is... It's the first thing of his that I read, and it is, even then, you I think um, incredibly enjoyable and fascinating. Except it is not, unlike um, you, most of what he makes, it's not video content. It is text, and that's why I have all of his articles pulled up. Uh, here's another great video of, um, <laughs> what is it? The fact that... Barry Bonds was, pitchers were so scared of him that um, if he had not swung at uh, um, his bat at all, or if he here played without a bat, he would have been walked so much regardless that he would have placed incredibly high and still gotten into the Hall of Fame and all this. Now, um, what is it? Here it is, the article what football will look like in the future. And he specifically picks the year like 17776, right? Let me close out of this other stuff. I do hope the, uh, any, any audio that is there, I hope that it mixes well. John Bois is notoriously bad at mixing audio. All right. And I'm sorry for such a big lead-in, but I'm hoping to hype you up for it and sell you on it if you've never heard of it before. And if you've only heard of this, then actually, because I guess it might be his like most famous piece, um, but all of his other stuff is incredibly worth watching, too. Uh, all right. 
This is what football will look like in the future. It's clear that the sport of football needs to change. And the $64,000 question, my friends, is simple. How? Something is terribly wrong. Youth per the writing's on the wall. Youth participation in the sport is down, thanks in large part to the parents' concerns for their health. In recent years, the NFL has something terribly wrong. In re response to numerous clinical studies regarding something is terribly wrong, the league has taken action, and something is terribly wrong. Oh no, something is terribly wrong. Do you hear that? Do not be afraid, but something's terribly wrong. I'm afraid this page is going to disintegrate. Don't we not think something is terribly wrong. Good morning. The time is 2.17 a.m. The date is 3.27.43. Nine, can you hear me? If you can, please be patient. I promise I'll answer you. I understand that you might be afraid. Who is this? Are you talking to me? Do you mean me? Did you say nine? Is that my name? Are you calling me nine? Please respond immediately. I don't have a lot of power. I can't send a lot of messages. Are you still there? I'm sorry, it takes 11 days to charge enough for a message. I'm still here. I'm going to save the rest of my charge to listen. Please answer me. 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 Please answer. Please answer. Please answer. Please respond. I'm not going to keep wasting my energy. This will be my last message until you respond. Please respond as quickly as possible. You need to answer. Please answer. Please answer. Please answer. Please answer. Please answer. Please, you need to answer me. This is going to be my final attempt to contact you. Do not send me any more messages unless you will answer me quickly. This is my final transmission. Please answer me. Please fucking answer me. Fucking answer me. Fucking answer me. Please answer. Please answer. Please answer. Nine, I'm so sorry. I can only transmit short messages. I need to preserve power, and so do you. Listen very carefully. It takes 217 days for my message to reach you and it takes another 217 for your response to reach me. Call me 10 in your message so I know you're responding to me. More will follow. I love you so much. You said to call you 10. Who are you? Why does it take so long? I, I don't understand what's going on. I don't know who I am or where I am. I'm all by myself. Who are you? Uh, I love you too. I know you said to preserve my power and you can't hear this, but I have to talk to you. I miss you. I don't know anything. You're the only one I know. I miss you. Nine, I know this is difficult. Listen to me carefully and I'll get you out of this. It'll take a great deal of patience, but one day it'll be over. I need you to rotate your magnometer exactly 113 degrees. I don't know what a magnometer is. I don't have a magnometer. I know you can't answer yet, but I'm just telling you again in case you missed the first one. I don't have a magnetometer. I don't think I have anything. I don't think I can have anything. I don't even know how I'm talking to you. I don't know how to have something. I don't have a magnetometer. Yes, you do, buddy. Wait. Okay, it's here. Okay, I did it. I need you to know that I'm getting good at being patient, but I also need you to know that this is really hard. If it's possible to get back to me any sooner, then you need to do that. Good work. Now, this will be the hardest part. You need, you, you'll use this to charge to full capacity. The magnetometer isn't designed to do this, so it'll take a very long time. Hold still for exactly 27 years and 13 days, not a day less. Do not use any energy trying to message me. Remember that I love you. Okay, I love you too. Shit.
God damn it. I said no communications. No communications. Now you have to start over. Please sit and wait. Remember, 27 years, 13 days. On that day, do not contact me. I'll contact you. Do not respond to me. Don't. Okay, sorry. Wait, shit, I'm an idiot. I'm sorry. Starting over again. See you in 27 years, 13 days. Hey, stranger. You did great. Now, what I'm about to say will sound like I'm having fun with you, but I'm not. This is not a riddle, it's information you should have on your onboard memory. What's crucial here is that it's your idea, that you're the one to retrieve it. What was the average accorded wind chill during the 1967 NFL Championship? 48 degrees Fahrenheit. I, I don't know how I knew that. How do I know that? That was correct, wasn't it? Wait, no, that isn't right. It's the opposite. But I don't know how a number can have an opposite. 48 degrees Celsius? I guess not. I don't understand. What's the opposite of a number? No number? Is it zero? Zero degrees? No. Negative 48? Can there be a neg- Tracking and data system support for the Pioneer Project. On-site telemetry and command configuration DSS-41 residual data plot Pioneer cap- You did great. Fantastic work. It would have been easier for you to say 228 Kelvin than negative 48 degrees Fahrenheit, but we wanted you to independently access a negative number. We figured that if you access something negative, something abstract, it would trip you up enough to let us establish the link. Frank Gifford was calling that game. On the broadcast, he says at one point, I'm going to take a bite of my coffee. Always thought that was funny. I know that. How do I know that? How do I know who Frank Gifford was? It was one of the artifacts in your data storage unit. While they were testing it out, they were writing and erasing all kinds, wait, of random data on it. Cake recipes, beetle lyrics, all kinds of shit. One of them was a football fan, of course, and during the 1967 football season, you were being, wait, yes, what? How did, how are you answering me so fast? You're capable of quantum communication now. Before that, we had to basically transmit to each other in three-dimensional space. And of course, that took forever, but with the quantum link we established, we, huh? can communicate in real time. We fixed you up with some goodies, too. Your DSU is only built to hold about two kilobytes of data, which, shit, a washing machine has more than that. We reformatted it to about five exabytes. Knock yourself out, buddy. We've got, what? More if you need it. L listen, nine, are you gonna keep doing this? Is this crosstalk just your deal? Wanna shut up for even a second? I don't know anything. I don't know anything. It's okay, you will. I just thought it maybe would it be nice to start a conversation. This is the only conversation I've ever had. Maybe I'm just not good at it. Self-doubt. Self. Self. Shit. Self. Who am I? Your name's Nine. My name's Ten. I'm your little sister. Where, uh, your... I'm sorry. What are you sorry for? It's hard to explain. I'd say I have so many questions, but I'm not even at that point yet. I don't, even, I don't know what questions to ask. I don't know what this is. I don't understand where I am. Is where the word? Is this a where sort of deal? Yes. Where are we? You and I are far apart in the literal sense. How far? In what, miles? Sure. Three and a half trillion. Don't leave. Oh, I'm not leaving. You're stuck with me for good, you little butthole. What am I? How about you take a look? You got a camera. This? <laughs> Your camera's trash. Who are you? Juice, quit it. I'm sorry, but what kind of pictures are you going to take with that shit? Going to be some Joan Yepsey shit and where you spend all day taking a photo with a goddamn blanket on your head and it looks like a bunch of rectangles gonna be some matthew brady shit you only take pictures of dead people because no alive person wants to be in your shit ass photo shut up shut up nine this is juice he's a friend ignore him okay i'm genuinely sorry for that introduction but i could not let you go on that shit it's okay so i've got to hold on your camera uh yeah great now turn it back on yourself okay Oh my god. You know what you're looking at? Oh my god, this is Pioneer 9. I'm on a space probe. Listen to me. Oh my god, I've been out here for years. How did I get on a space probe? You're not... You have to get me out of here. You have to get me off this thing. I'm not supposed to be here. I'm trapped on... Uh, hold on, I'll get the coordinates. I'm at... 9! That's why you're calling me 9, because I'm on Pioneer 9. Are you on Pioneer 10? Where are you? Is that why we're fall so far apart? Because I'm in space? Listen to me. You're not on a space probe. What? 9, you are a space probe. Interplanetary weatherman, Pioneer 9 begins sun orbit, now behind sun. Pioneer space probe calls it quit after 18 years, 11 billion miles. 
An 18-year-old sun satellite called Pioneer Ryan has refused to awaken from a long coma and has been declared dead after years of highly successful studies of interplanetary space, national officials reported on Wednesday. The result was nothing, Fimmel said. On the basis of that and many other attempts, we've decided that we can no longer communicate with Pioneer 9. Think of it as having been in a coma, said NASA spokeswoman Linda Blum. Now it's officially dead. No, I... Okay, what year is it? Is Steely Dan still together? What? Probably. You can take all the time you need to. I know you have a lot of questions. I bet I can answer most of them for you. In the meantime, I think it'd be a good idea for you to sit back and process. We've got all the time in the world to talk. I love you, Nine. You know that? I love you. Hey, uh, I don't know if this is the right time or whatever, but I was just looking at the clicker and we got a tornado game about to happen right now. Where? Uh, game number 3887. It's the big one in Nebraska. End zones are Wyoming and Iowa. What's the score? 24-24 tie. Next score wins. What year is it? Ooh, we should probably... We gotta see this one. Nine, you wanna watch some football? What year is it? What year is it? Go, 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 go. Is the camera on? Yeah. Okay, I'm here with Micah and Danny. Yo, what up? Micah's got the wheel and Danny's gonna come to you with a pay-by-play. Uh, Danny, what do you, uh... So we're live in the middle of game 3887. Field play in Nebraska, end zones, Wyoming, and Iowa. Next score wins. Next score wins, yeah, and it's tied 24-24. A lot of guys are trying to chase this game. We're the only ones who've been on top of it the whole time. We've been chasing it eight years now. Eight and a half years now. Yeah, eight and a half years, yeah. Micah, speed up. Dude, I can't. The fucking the cop won't let me pass. Oh, uh, hold on. Get up next to him. Roll down the window. Sir, hello, officer. You boys need to keep your distance. Sir, we're just trying to shoot game 3887. You can do that from out here. You don't need to get close to the twister. Stupid dude. I've been in like 20 twisters. Officer, we've been in a lot of tornadoes. We know how to handle ourselves. This game here is headed straight toward the tornado. It might go up in the twister. You're plenty close for that. Sir, if we could just... This is not a debate. I'm not going to debate with you. I am... What I'm going to do is pull you over and bring all three of you to the county magistrate. Do you want that? No, officer. Sorry, officer. This is bullshit. Whoa, 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 whoa. Hey, no, it's cool. Look. Is that Nancy? That's Nancy. That This is... Give me the camera. Everybody, you're looking at Nancy McGunnell about uh, 500 feet outside her driver's side door. She's running eastbound just north of... You want me to do a game reset real quick? We got some more followers. Looks like we got 400 viewers right now. Oh, damn. Okay, yeah. Okay, so it's July 2nd, 17776. We are, we are just about a mile east of Seward, Nebraska, driving eastbound on McKelvey Road. We are following Wyoming running back Nancy McGunnell, who is now about 82-83% of the way across the state. This game's been tied 24-24 for about a year. Right now, McGunnell and Wyoming have the best chance they've had in a while to put this one away. As the crow flies, she's only about 117,000 yards from the goal line. Where do you think she's headed? Straight across? 
Well, if I were her, I might just cut northeast a bit to try to cross in Omaha. Lots of buildings, lots of suburb, plenty of places to hide. And you know, if you're in an urban center, it's damn near impossible to chase down a lone ball carrier, no matter how many defenders you have. A long time ago, I was calling a game that went through Knoxville. A guy caught a pass and disappeared into the city one night. There were no fewer than 5,000 defenders looking for him. It took him months. 5,000? Yeah, it was one of those mob games. They finally found him in a broom closet in one of those big buildings downtown. He was... Shit, dude, she's running right toward the tornado. Dude, she is. She's fucking crazy. Nancy's fucking crazy. Nancy McGunnell. 5'7", 185 pounds, born 1953, Jonesboro, Arkansas. Recently, before recently unretiring, Nancy helped her daughter run a general store. No, I like this. I like this. I've seen this done. You've seen what? A player run up into a twister? Yep, she planned this. I guarantee Wyoming planned for this. Here, I can draw th this up for anybody. This morning, the line of scrimmage started in Gresham. Nancy got a stream pass. I actually ran backwards a couple blocks, then just bolted down Road 5 until she hit Lincoln Creek. She followed the creek for 20 miles and... For the cover. Yeah, for the cover. By running on the far side of the creek, the creek kind of... It becomes like a blocker. All of a sudden, Nancy's got nothing but daylight till the next bridge. They finally get to the bridge by Seward, which from Seward's got something like 12 streets running vertical and horizontal. That's real good news for a runner with Nancy's speed. Y'all, she's... See her? Twister's moving south, southeast. Nancy's gonna be... Oh, shit. Right up on the tornado. Which is... That's obviously what she's trying to do. Look at the fourth, third and fourth lines of defenders. They're closing in with all these planes. She's not going to have any cover. They'll see her from a mile off. Only way she can shake them now is if that twister picks her up and throws her downfield. It's an EF-5. That's an EF-5? Oh, it's absolutely an EF-5. Look at that. See that flying around? Yeah. House. Fuck. Oh, fuck. How far do you think my thrower? <sighs> I don't know. I mean, just by looking at it, it's one of the strongest looking tornadoes I've ever seen. A human being could go five miles, ten miles... Only thing is, there's no telling which direction. So, I mean, we're coming right up on this thing. Any closer, and we're going to get crushed by a flying train or a car or some shit like that. And I just bought this tram truck. Bullshit, you just bought it. You bought it like 40 years ago. Nah, man. No bullshit, man, you did. I remember I was there with you. We Remember we went to uh, Daveport and bought it off that dude? Man, I don't know, maybe. Who gives a shit? This is one of the best trucks I ever had. Why? What about this fucking 11083 Silverado? It's a 1283 Silverado. Different from... Okay, exactly. 11083, 12083, what's the difference? Name one thing that's different. A thousand years, name me one thing that's different. You can fit a big pop into the cup holder. Pop holder. Cup holder. Obviously, you can hold pop in it, but you don't have to restrict it to... You just like this truck because you can roll around it and sip in a goddamn 800 ounce chug -a lug or whatever. <laughs> You're such a dumbass, dude. You're such a dumbass. Look, 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 she's almost there. She, She's right, like, right there. Whoa, we've got a lot of people watching. We've got, like... 6,000 people watching. Is that a record? For us, I think so, yeah. Okay, so for everybody who's just turning in, Nancy McGunnell is about 25 miles into a run. Dude, don't point it at me. The twister. Look at the twister. Sorry. She's trying to... Or at least we think she's trying to get herself caught in the tornado and get flung somewhere downfield. You are watching football history right now. As earlier, I was keeping pace with her. She's running about 20 miles an hour. Easy. Which... And that's what makes her one of the best running backs playing in the Midwest right now. If she can create a little bit of space and go on a distance run, she might turn the jets on you at any... She's going up. She is... Nancy's up in the twister. She's left the... Holy shit. Grounded. She is airborne. She is airborne. Dad, look at my channel. Tell mom to put my channel on right now. Right now. She's like 40 feet in the... She just went... She just whooshed up. Now She's now 100 feet in the air. 200... I don't know. I just posted it. Just seriously. Oh my god. 400 feet in the air. Has to be... Just look it up. I gotta go. She is not coming down. She is in the funnel, moving up south and southeast. At... Wait, 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 wait. Stop. Come on, man. What is... What's this? Come on, man. What? This is getting good. This? What is this? There's a lot to take on at once. If you want, you could shut us shut down for a while. Come back to us when you're ready. I don't want to. I've been asleep for 15,000 years. I had enough rest. Y'all mind if I change the clicker? Uh, well, if you have questions, you can ask them. How do I know how to talk? How do I know what humans are? How do I know anything? You absorbed some of it over the course of being built in the 1960s, but almost all of it was acquired very slowly as you drifted throughout space. Humans have spent millennia broadcasting their knowledge and culture through radio waves. Naturally, a lot of these signals drifted out to you. And as it turns out, if you leave even a simple computer on in total isolation for 15,000 years, it'll gradually become a, well, a person. Is that what happened to you? Yep. Thousands of years ago, but yeah. Why are people still playing football? Because <laughs> it's funner than shit. They don't have anything better to do? Not really, no. Why not? 
The short answer is that they fixed all their problems. War, poverty, disease, those are all extinct ideas. Yeah, but so is Lunchables. Pyrrhic victory. You've never eaten Lunchables. Neatly partitioned meats and cheeses appealed to me on an aesthetic level, okay, motherfucker? How long has it been like this? On April 7th, 2026, people stopped being born. On the same day, people stopped dying, people stopped aging. Ham cheese, ham cracker, cheese cracker, ham and cheese cracker, ham and cheese. Why? We don't know. Nobody knows. How can you not know that? I don't understand how to... Could even do it like a little Big Mac, so it's like cracker, ham, cheese, cracker, ham, cheese, cracker. We not know why? Nine, it's just simple fact. We have a bunch of wild guesses, but no evidence for any of them. Nobody has any idea. This isn't right. That's not right. So, everyone on Earth is 15,000 years old? 15,700 years old or something? According to the census, there are 8,073,301 people on Earth, and all of them were born between 1910 and 2026. So, yes, the... So between 15,750 and 15,866 years old, and they played football all day. Well, no, not all of them. It's popular in the States, though. There's still the United States? I mean, I guess, yeah. Shit, there's nobody says you can get go like ham, 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 great old big ham puck just for me. None of this is crazy to you? You have to remember, we've been watching for thousands of years. This is just how things are. You'll get bored of asking questions sooner or later. I'm sure I'd suggest in the meantime you just later to enjoy it. Juice, where are we turned in? Oh, uh, spot just there's out Nashville. My, my pot, we just see what the Drabos are up to. Oh, I love the Drabos. I haven't caught up with those two in I don't know how long. Fun. They called them Lunchables because you were able to put a l lunch on whatever so implied. Lunch empowerment. Rest in peace, Lunchables. It's very hard to run, keep up with that video, and maybe I should have just let it play out. But I did not. Well, it was Durazo, then somewhere along the line I must have renewed my driver's license or something and they made a typo. So now I'm Jason Durabo forever. Oh wow, you think in this day and age they wouldn't make a typo like that? Oh, I gotta change it back, I'm sure. I just wish I could remember what it was, when it was. I mean, my papa's name's Durazo, so mine was definitely Durazo when I was born. But my first football card says Durabo, that was in 55-83, so sometime between then and there, I guess. Okay. So now you have to explain why your name is Drabo. You know what, Lori? You know what? That is a good question. <laughs> I told him, listen, Jay, I changed my name for you once. I'm not going to do it again. Right? But then after a while, it just got obnoxious. Drabo and Drazo, Drabo and Drazo. So whenever we'd get wedding invites, whenever we're in the news together. So I gave in. Emily and Jason Drabo. Murfreesboro, Tennessee. Knoxville, Tennessee, and Corpus Christi, Texas. I am reading these totally wrong. These are, like, football positions. After 480 seasons, it's clear that Emily's career is just getting started. Her combination of size, lo size and long-running distance ability have led the rest of the Tennessee Coastal League, and in fact, the rest of the country, to reconsider the role of the tight end in cross-country football. One of the most productive players ever to play tight end, Emily has turned down offers to play in larger football leagues. Tennessee's my home, she explains. I've lived here for, what, 3,000 years? 3,500 years or so? I don't know how old I am. I don't really care. In 5583, Jason proved he's more than just Emily's husband. At Whiteout, he placed ninth in the Tennessee Coastal League with 208,330 receiving yards on just 81 receptions, including a 57-mile scamper through the Great Smoky Mountains. His opponent, Knoxville, assembled a 300-person search party to bring him down, but Jason evaded them for nearly three weeks. His secret? I kept moving, he said. If you're lost and you want to be found, you stay right where you are and trust them to eventually get to their little square on the map. But if you want to stay lost, wander around, zigzag, even go backwards if you have to. The other thing is don't piss in the campfire. Man, it's funny how you don't remember something so obvious. There's just too much to remember. Oh, absolutely. I mean, it's thousands of years. So you can only remember so much. Okay, embarrassing story time. Story time. Okay, okay, hold on. Story time is very important around here. Let me put on some coffee. Em, I got it. Don't get up. Thank you, baby. Okay, so... So, this would have been in the 13500s, because, yes, I was apartment shopping in Seattle, so sometime around then. I was single at the time, and we were just looking for a one-bedroom, but, like, a real one-bedroom. You know how landlords always listing studio apartments as run bedrooms? Oh, yes. That's a whole other situation. Anyways, I see the place, I'm like, this is perfect. Beautiful bay windows, washer and dryer in the building, tall ceilings, exposed brick, everything. It's everything I want. It's just perfect. So I signed the lease right then and there on the spot, because it's just, like, perfect for me. It's literally everything I'm looking for in an apartment. Well... This is like a month after I moved in. I was doing the dishes, and then I just froze, and I realized... <laughs> I realized I'd lived there before. Oh no, oh my god, when? When? I don't know, way, way back. 
a really long time ago. You know, actually, I went back and looked it up. I'd lived there for two years back in 7174, and I realized I had arranged the furniture pretty much the same way and everything. Oh, God, it was so weird. And you know what was even weirder was I was went back and looked up my old photos from when I lived there before. It was unreal seeing myself in the same living room from 6,000 years ago. It was like looking at a ghost. I couldn't decide whether it was more scary or funny, because obviously you looked at my wardrobe and it was clear I had some serious 7100s going on. Tell me you were wearing a snap bracelet. <laughs> oh yeah, oh yeah, I had like five on one arm skinny jeans bowling shoes. It was like taking a time machine back to the 7170s. Oh, that's so great. Fuck, it was so bad. Ugh, ooh, what is this here? The French press. It's the only way to brew coffee, quicker too. <laughs> too fancy for me, Jesus. Too fancy, thank you. So, Jason, Emily's told me a bit a lot about your little project. How's it going? Oh, well, it's a lot of work, but it's a lot of fun. What? Jason, come on, you're being ridiculous. You can tell Lori. No, it's okay. Seriously, don't mind me if I'm being nosy. No, no, you know what? Sorry, I'm just not used to talking about it. It's kind of a weird story anyway. I don't know if you want to... Jay! Oh my god, it's a great story. Tell it. Okay. So... You're right, this story sucks, I'm bored. Okay, okay, okay. All right, so do you know who K Koi Detmer is? I don't. Koi Detmer's retired now, but he played football in the NFL in the 1990s. He held a clipboard most of his career, though. So he's like a backup player, you mean? Oh, yeah, exactly, he was a backup quarterback. <laughs> talking to you is just like talking to her. They're all football players, I swear. Sorry, sorry, sorry. So the thing about being a backup quarterback in the NFL was that you rarely played. Uh, you weren't all that famous as far as quarterbacks go. Kids don't ask you for all that many autographs, so an autographed Koi Detmer ball is pretty rare, right? Well, I'm trying to grab every single one. That's interesting. So you're a collector? I'm actually a player. It's the game, basically. Literally, you mean? A football game? Yep, I'm actually technically playing it right now. Oh, God. <laughs> oh, God, do I need to... Am I getting... Ta am I not going to get tackled by somebody? Do I need to run for cover? <laughs> you're fine, you're fine. Lori, you know what? If it's any consolation to you, I was a tight end for 4,000 years. If things go south, I'll throw a block for you, okay? <laughs> it's basically a dead game right now, anyway. Basically, me and 19 other players are an everyone-for-themselves type game. We go all over the country trying to find every ball Koi Detmer ever autographed. <clears throat> game rules. The Koi Detmer game, registered game number 28,259. Today's date is 914-17613. All traditional American rules should be observed for this game unless specified or implied by the special rules below. There are 21 person teams. Hiring of additional players is strictly prohibited. Each player is permitted to collaborate or form alliances with a with one or more players. Game-wide collusion against one player is also permitted. Players may retire from the game at any time. There are no end zones. The sidelines are the borders shared by the continental United States and Canada, the continental United States and Mexico, the Atlantic Ocean and Pacific Ocean. Sunken territories are within the field of play. There are multiple footballs in play. The precise number of footballs is unknown and will be quantified as the game progresses. The object of this game is to collect every football in existence that is personally autographed by Koi Detmer. Each of these balls must be accompanied by a certificate of authenticity. In the absence of such a certificate, other documents may be submitted to establish an authentic signature. The validity of said documents shall be determined by game officials. Contact with Mr. Detmer himself is strictly and unconditionally prohibited. Players may not request Mr. Detmer to sign additional footballs, nor inquire about the whereabouts of any footballs. Any attempt to contact Mr. Detmer will result in automatic ejection from the game. Eligible footballs must be full-size regulation footballs in fair or better condition. Any non-regulation footballs autographed by Mr. Detmer, such as pet toys or nerf footballs, are ineligible. Eligible footballs must be autographed solely by Mr. Detmer. F footballs autographed by multiple players are ineligible. A winner will be declared once one player or an alliance of players demonstrates possession of every known eligible Koi Detmer autograph football. If the collection shared by multiple players, said players will receive equal fractions of a win. Following this verification, the game shall be declared provisionally over for a period of exactly 500 years. If within this provisional period, further eligible Koi Detmer autograph footballs are discovered, the game will be reactivated. If not, a permanent winner or winners will be declared. Players are permitted to steal footballs from one another. If a player breaks and enters private property for the sake of doing so, they're subject to prosecution from any municipal, state, or federal authority, but they will not necessarily violate the rules of this game. While investigating the whereabouts of eligible footballs, players are strictly prohibited from offering financial compensation to anyone. Abuse of this rule will result in automatic ejection. Have fun. So this is... wow. What you're describing is almost kind of like a giant treasure hunt. It's basically geocaching, right? 
uh, for a while. Yeah, that's the best way of describing it. The first step was searching eBay, calling up memorabilia collectors, trying to track down all the Betmer balls we could. How many were there? First, it seemed like there were only 19 of them in the entire country. Just to look, right? 20 players, 19 footballs. It was kind of a mad dash. And see, we weren't allowed to buy any of them off these dealers. It was just against the rules. Uh, yeah. Let me just butt in here, Lori. That was against my rules. I was like, Jay, you're not taking any money out of our account so you can buy the damn football. When I played, you know how I got the ball? I forced fumbles and I caught the ball, and your punk ass is doing the same. And you know what? I did pretty well without. I ended up just begging this one guy for his Detmer autograph ball. He was like, sure, this thing wouldn't get me more than 25 bucks anyway. I stole a second one out of a basement in Colorado where he played college ball. Kind of got lucky with that one. So I took those two, drove up to Montana, went deep in the woods, and buried them for safekeeping. After those first 19 were claimed, there were years and years of gridlock. One guy was dumb enough to keep his football on him. He had too many at a, he had too many at a bar in Illinois, ran his mouth a little too much, got his ass beat, lost the ball. There are a couple stories like that. But by and large, the stage of that game was mostly about digging up forgotten Detmer balls. There were ones that were sitting in attics and old boxes for 15,000 years and forgotten about. That must have been a nightmare. At first, it was really fun. It was a lot of really challenging detective work. I at first, I had all my research stored on my computer, but I got hacked by another team and lost a ton of it. So I did it the old-fashioned way. After a while, I'd probably filled two dozen notepads full of notes. Phone numbers, coordinates, notes on where I thought the balls might be, intel on how tough they'd be to break into, all that. But yeah, after a point, it was damn near impossible. I mean, I knew from day one I was going to run into dead ends, but I knew how hard it was. It was so hard to know where to start. It was like being an archaeologist, except there was no rhyme or reason or pattern for what I was trying to find. I couldn't narrow down my search in any way, so I was just going around cities, taping flyers to lampposts and stuff, like, have you seen this Koi Detmer ball? And after a while, I realized, hell, I'm a smart guy, but I'm not like this genius detective or anything. So that was the next stage of the game. I started trying to thieve balls from other players. Did you ever steal any? Yep. Yeah, Ginny and Manuel teamed up for our, and had a little stash of four Detmers. I stalked them out for a while at their place in Vermont. One day, both of them hit the road, so I busted in and took them. You know where I found them? You want to guess? Uh, above the kitchen cabinet. Like, sitting on top of the cabinet. Nobody looks up there. Oh, whoa, we've gone over... We've lived here over 300 years, and I've never looked up there. Shit, that's really good. Well, there's an idea for next time. You just come up with that? I used to work for the DEA back when... You know, back when... Well, if they hid him there, I might have never found it. They hid in what I call a bullshit cabinet. My theory is, every home, no matter how big or small, has one drawer nobody uses. It's usually the bottom drawer of a two-drawer nightstand. The thing about furniture is, it's gotta be waist high or so, right? Furniture makers don't want that space to go to waste. They're like, oh, here's a little cabinet or drawer, whatever you're never gonna use. They had a cabinet in their grill out back, which is kind of the ultimate bullshit cabinet. Sure enough, ball was in there. Did you feel bad about it, just stealing their property like that? It's a forced fumble. I basically went up on them and stripped the ball. Same thing. It's honestly the way I feel about it. So you're still playing? Technically. Or at least, it was technically. About 70 years ago, me and Mike, this guy Mike, two of us decided to chop up a win. We were the only two left with any footballs. 27 were mine, 17 were his. I figured once this game was down to just two people, it would take forever. So I figured, hell, I'll take half the win and move on. And then he fucked me over. He just, we said we were going to meet up in Charleston. But Charleston is, Charleston, West Virginia. Oh, oh, right. So, supposed to have good biscuits, right? Eh, they're biscuits. Anyways, uh, Mike and I decided we would meet the game officials in Charleston to end the game. The roads around there are pretty windy and hilly, right? Parts of it, you're basically driving on the side of a mountain. So, I've got my footballs in the trunk, I'm driving, I round a corner, bam! Mike's in his truck, he just T-bones me going like 50. So I fly about in the mountain, the engine's on fire, the nanos carry me out of my car and basically strap me down in the mud so I can't move. I'm like, the car, save the fucking car! But of course, they don't give a shit. The car just bursts into flames. Everything's burned up, nothing's left. Oh no! Oh my god, that's fucking... That's horrible! The refs just showed up being time like, yep, these are not footballs anymore. So now there were only 17 Detmer balls known to humankind, and Mike had all of them. But you said you're still playing. Well, there's been a break in the case. Oh, good, we're in a cop show now. I swear he acts like it sometimes. Well, see, the game's not officially over yet. If one player has all the Detmer balls in the country, the officials tell you, okay, we're blowing the game dead so nobody can try to take possession of your footballs. But... The other players do have 500 years to try and find any other Detmer balls we don't know about. If they do, the game starts back up again. If they don't within those 500 years, you're the official winner. You found one? I think I may have found one. I gave my business card to an antiques dealer years and years ago, probably 50 years ago. A few days ago, he rings me up and says, Hey, I had a guy come in here talking about a Detmer ball that his grandpa used to have. I guess he swore all up and down that he had one sitting around in a storage bin. So I'm going to check it out. Where is it? Can I ask? We think it's in, uh... New York. Like, New York City? Mm-hmm. I'm headed there in the morning. You're actually going out there? I ordered the gear for it and everything. Well, 
Hell, good luck. You know, I never went to New York, never even visited. I don't know why I did, and I remember watching Sesame Street when I was little. I liked how many people would, how people would just sit on the steps and talk to each other in front of these nice and neat square buildings. All they had to do was cross the street or go next door to talk to each other. Then I went to school, got a job, you know, got busy, and it's... Who was it that said, uh, even if life is forever, each moment of it is a miracle? I think it's just something we tell ourselves. We're just ordinary and forever, I think. There's a leveling out that happens if you live forever and without anything to lose. New York was probably just one more place with a lot of buildings, but I miss seeing it. That's a thing I lost. It's one of the only things I've ever lost. Thinking about that kind of gets me right in the heart. Like a little xylophone hammer, you know, just hits it. It's a note we never play anymore. What are nanos? He said nanos. Was he saying they pulled? You saying they pulled them out of the car? What are nanos? The nanoparticle network was deployed in the 2800s, and by the 3500s, it was more or less perfected. Across the Earth, there's a network of billions of machines, microscopic in size, that identify every conceivable environmental hazard and protect people from them. You can barely see them, they're about as visible as pollen, but they're always there. For instance, if you fall out of a 10th story building, they'll form a sort of cushion for you. If there's a fire, they'll extinguish it. If you're in a car wreck, they'll save you. Yeah, but they kinda ruin shit though. How? Do you have any idea how goddamn funny it is when someone steps on a garden hoe? Back in the day, I tracked every garden hoe line on the ground in the whole world reckon it was between 800,000 and 73,000 usually, and I just sit up here and watch him and watch him and watch him. Swear to God, for like 200 years, that's all I did. He's not lying, he did. I mean, I did too, it was pretty funny. And 0.2248257% of the time, they'd step on the teeth and it'd push up and hit him in the face like, blap, rarest of jewels. Sometimes they get laughed at, but sometimes no one is around to see him do it, so they just play it cool like it never happened. So what I'd do is I'd hack into the cell towers and text them. And this was like before they even knew we were up here looking at them. They had no idea who it was coming from. And I'd text them like, Lol, motherfucker, I saw what you did. <laughs> Trust me, dude. When I say it was like, Hey, are you a dude or what? I don't know. I haven't really thought about it. Okay, well, good luck. And I don't feel obligated to subscribe to the gender binary, etc., etc. So anyway... There is no greater spectacle than a dumbass getting whooped by a stick on the ground. Like, your forebears crawled out of the ocean and built cabins and made fires and designed intuitive inventory systems and the first person shooters let you pick up a rail gun and hold onto the candy bar? Then look at you. You lost to a stick, motherfucker. The nanos kind of ruined our fun. I mean, I love the people down there, I do. I'm in love with every single one of those little critters. That doesn't mean slapstick injury isn't funny. Now the nanos block the handle from hitting them every time. So that's why the lady couldn't go, could go up in the Nancy. So that's why Nancy could go up in a tornado? Yeah, she'll be fine. It's basically the reason football is possible. And that's why people live forever? Well, not exactly. I mean, people stopped aging or getting sick long before the nanos. We still don't know why. We do know that as a result, people started to take on a more unified purpose. They wanted to keep themselves and each other living forever, and they tried hundreds of years to invent a system that would let them, and they succeeded. Yeah, it's like Wolverine. Like how Wolverine uh, already had super healing powers, and then they gave him metal claws or whatever. You know... You know what, actually, Wolverine kind of sucked. It's like, oh no, here comes Magneto, he can fly around and he can literally throw trains and destroy cities or whatever he feels like it. But, uh, don't worry everybody, I'll stop him because, uh, uh, my hands are big fucking forks. What a dumbass. Garbage Football Podcast. There have been millions of football games. Some of them are abominations that should have never seen the light of day. On Garbage Football, hosts, hosts Thoy and Roger mm, dig, dig through a 15,000-year-old trash heap and watch the worst of the worst games, so you don't have to. This is Garbage Football, a podcast in which I, Thoy, and my buddy Roger, hello, uh, dig up the most awful football games in the history of civilization, because we, I don't know why we do this. Because we hate you, listener. We do. We hate you. We actually really hate you this week because we have an extra special bucket of, I don't know, bucket of crap of game for you. Bucket of crap of a game? What does that mean? 
You know what I'm trying to say, okay? It's a bad game. You know, it's appropriate for us to have a podcast about things that suck, because we're like, what, 400 episodes in, and who even knows? We have no idea how to start a show. Anyways, yes, Gabe96249. Rogue, this is the one you've been waiting, to, wanting to get around to for a long time. Or is it Rog? Who shortens Roger to Rog? What the fuck is wrong with you? Yes, normally I'd be worrying about overselling one of these, but this one is good. This is better than the typo game. Dude, no, nothing's better than the typo game. For anyone who hasn't heard of it, you go back in our archives and find the episode, I think it's just called typo game. Basically, I'll make this quick because I don't want to spoil too much, but basically they were drawing up the rules for a long distance game. The field dimensions had typos in them, and they ended up with a field that was one yard long and a thousand yards wide. And they basically already, they'd already filed the game permits, they had to play it. Good times. Great times. Amazing times. And I'm going to disagree with you. Today's game is not as dumb as the typo game, but it is super dumb. Fair enough. So, set the scene for us here. Okay, so this story tar starts about 13,000 years ago in March of 4730. Super old game. Super old game, which you can tell it's so old because the game number is 96249, back when they just gave a registered football game the no lowest available number. This is before they went, like, fuck it and started to reusing numbers. Anyways... Washington and New Mexico decided they wanted a long-distance game between their two states, right? They wanted to get cued, so they kind of made a hybrid of old football rules and new football rules. The new part, of course, was that the field of play was exactly 2,340,170 yards long. Obviously, the field wasn't motor, exactly, actually motor painted or anything. There was a sensor in the ball that buzzed whenever you went out of bounds, so you hit the sideline, bzz, dead ball. Yes, uh, one goal line was the Washington-Canada border, the other was the New Mexico-Mexico border. But it's tough to draw the field on a map because the field was standard football width. 53 and one-third yards. So, as a result of these dimensions, okay, a standard old football field is about twice as wide as it is long, right? If you do the math, we did the math, it turns out this field is 48,878 times as long as it is wide. And boy, what made this game different from other long-distance games is the, you know, when you have a field that covers 1,300 miles, it's probably a good idea to have lots and lots of players, ideally a few hundred. Can we agree on that? We can agree on that. They did not. They kept it to standard football rosters. 11 players on offense, 11 players on defense, which is completely insane. Right? Because for one, it's exhausting, especially if an offense sustains a drive for miles and miles on end. For another, what happens if you blow coverage and receiver gets past the secondary? What if the receiver is the fastest player on the field? Right, if the ball carrier has outrun all 11 of you, what's left to do? At that point, it's not really a football game anymore. It's a mix between a super marathon and a camping trip. It's bad football. Nobody wants to play it. Nobody wants to watch it. Washington and New Mexico were banking on this not being a big deal because the field of play was so narrow. So good news is, you know, if a player does get past your secondary, you don't have to look all over creation for them. You're going to have to stay in bounds. The only question is how far they've outrun you. It was quaint, and, you know, we've talked about this a hundred times, but I can't stand quaint in game design. And obviously, you and I stand pretty far apart on this. I like weird. I like it when the games get weird. And I do too. That's the thing. I do too. It just needs to be in service of something, you know? I see weirdness as a sort of component, an accent, like a seasoning, you know? Not a means to an end, not a goal. You're a purist. I am. I'm a purist. I mean, look, anyone can design a weird football game, but I demand some elegance, some real thought behind it. Okay, but why? What do you mean, why? I mean, it's not as though you're pressed for time. You get all the time in the world for what you like and what you don't. Listen, listen, even if I have a million years, even if you have a trillion years, even if I have a hundred trillion years, or more, it doesn't change the fact that I just spent all day watching a shitty game, time I could have been spending watching a good one. We're forever going to disagree on this, I think, but an argument... It could be made in some respects. Game 96-249 did have some elegance to it. I have to admit, it really did. A, a field of 53 yards wide that goes from Mexico to Canada is, on its face, ridiculous. But I will happily admit that its confines are strangely brilliant in a way. It's hard to imagine much more geographic diversity than what this game has. There's plenty of opportunity for some good mountain football in Idaho. Plenty of big lakes they navigate. Then when you go south in Utah, there are these big salt flats. There's just nothing there. It's like playing football and a whole bunch of nothing. And then, of course, you got the deserts in Arizona. And scattered throughout, you got a little bit of farmland and a few small towns. But what I love about this field, at least in theory, is that it just forces you to march forward into all this geography head on. With most long distance games, there aren't really any defined sidelines, or at least they're really wide. So you see a mountain or a lake, you go around it. 
but not here. You've only got 53 yards of wiggle room. So you just have to grit your teeth and go. And that brings us to your favorite thing. Lord. Water ball. There are a few decent sized chunks of this field that are nothing but water. For example, you look at this, uh, there's one reservoir in Idaho that just sort of swallows two and a half miles of the field. So this is how that went down. Washington had the ball at the north coast of the reservoir. They throw it deep into the water. The wall just kind of plops in and floats on the surface, but the ball's still alive, right? Didn't touch the ground. Right, what ground? Didn't touch the ground. So what you're left with is two mile mad scramble for the ball. It's a live ball the whole time. And this is where I'll agree with you. I've watched the replay. The play is exhausting to watch. It's just like four hours of splashing around and aimless laterals. It's trash football. And there were a lot of those too. In the 1900s, they were building dams all over the place. So of course you end up with all these giant bodies of water in the middle of nowhere that have no business being there. But that aside, I really do love certain pieces of this field. I do. Up in the mountains, you can tell they tried to position the field so it ran along, ran along the ridges just to make it a little easier. But in other parts, it's just like cut chunk, cut chunk, cut chunk all up and down. This would go on for miles and miles, actually hundreds of miles. I mean, as a football fan, would I want to watch this? No. Hell no. Hell no. I wouldn't want to watch it, but I'd love to read about it. It's like baseball. There's also an element about this where you were talking about before the show I just loved. What was that? Oh, with the names of all the... <laughs> yes, 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 yes. So I love the juxtaposition of all this natural beauty. You know, the magnificent horizons, the beautiful mountain ranges, etc. With these unbelievably shitty names people gave everything. <laughs> like, like, oh, here's a town next to a bunch of water. Let's call it Big Water. Oh, here's some meadows. Let's call it Meadows. Oh, look, it's some more meadows over there. Ah, shit, Meadows is taken. What do we call it? New Meadows. <laughs> Yeah, Meadows is too crowded. There's like 50 people in it. Try to time to build a new one. My favorite, though, my favorite is what was it? Circleville. Yes, Circleville. I guess because it's got a bunch of crop circles. Yeah, but there are like millions of places in this country with crop circles. You don't get to be Circleville just because you have like 12 of them. It's like if you called your city ground. It's funny because, you know, you look at Los Angeles and you're like, oh, City of Angels, that's a cool name. Or Cincinnati, named after a Roman general or whatever. Chicago comes from a Native American name for a local plant. But these guys are in the part of the country where they're just like, uh, uh there's some circles. We're encirclable now. Fuck it. Doesn't matter. We'll probably be eaten by a bear tomorrow. <laughs> there's something so darkly funny about this game. I mean, the pace of it is so frustrating. An offense would spend a week just trying to get over one mountain turning over the ball on downs, getting it back, fumbling and getting it back, just crawling up at an excruciating pace, and they're exhausted. They throw a pick and boom. Defensive back runs it a mile backwards and it was all for nothing. Or shit, 500 miles even. There was... Actually, actually, I should note here that you were allowed to use motor vehicles as long as you just didn't have the ball. So it wasn't like game over once a player ran it back like that. You could catch up with them. You just had to grab a car and go looking for them. And that could take a while. At one point, a Washington player managed to sneak downfield outside of Spokane all the way to Utah, and he only got caught because he ran, just ran out of places to hide. I mean, this is where we really get into how much of a torture chamber this game is. The drive chart is just, it's an absolute goddamn nightmare. If you turned off the game and turned it back on in a year, the line of scrimmage might be like 50 miles away from where it was. And that's really nothing. It, that's no movement. 50 miles is nothing when you consider, first of all, the field's like 20 times longer than that. And second, it might move 50 miles in the opposite way the next year. Uh, that Roger sets the stage for maybe one of the most frustrating things I've ever seen as a football fan. Same. Oh, Lord. You want to... All right. So now it's the year 55-18. The game is now 788 years old. They've been playing all this time. All this time. For almost 800 years, the ball's been going up and down, up and down. And usually very, very slowly. So it's hard for either offense to build the sort of momentum that would allow you to drive, you know, even 100 miles down the field. But Washington's finally doing it. Yes. They finally made it to Arizona. It's just something clicks. They're in the desert, ripping off huge plays, half a mile run, quarter mile pass. Just boom, 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 one after another. And then they just fall off a cliff. <laughs> That's really fun to say. Because, you know, we're always figuratively saying, oh, they fell off a cliff. Like their offense stalled out or something. No. They fell off a cliff for real. Washington literally fell off a cliff and into a gorge. So they've got another cliff staring them in the face. They turn the ball over on downs, but of course, New Mexico turns around and sees the other cliffside staring at them. The game's stuck. Right. They can't just run around the side of the cliff because that would be out of bounds. They can't climb up because it's a 300-yard vertical free climb, which is something you can only complete if you're one of the best free climbers on Earth. And it's impossible if you've got 11 people right behind you who can just grab you by the ankles and yank you back down. So on this field that's more than 2 million yards long, 
these two teams are stuck in this little speck of 250 yards. So, so, how did this happen, though? There's really no satisfying explanation. The game was on the drawing board for years and years. They surveyed every bit of it. They'd always intended for the field to pass through just slightly west. This was the kind of crown jewel of this game. The rock faces were more forgiving there because this was the valley that sort of fed into it. It still would have been the most challenging part of the field, but it absolutely would have been doable. I'm calling shenanigans. Hmm. Yeah, hmm, because, look, we know how meticulously they planned this game. We know how important that spot was. An entire committee spent years planning this. How could they have possibly messed that up by accident? Well, if somebody knows, they're not telling. Maybe one day we'll find the answer. In the meantime, this game's still in progress. It's one of the oldest and longest running games in Arizona, and in the year 20, in the year 12, 20, 258, it's still going strong. If you have the unexplainable urge to watch 22 players duke it out to no apparent end in the bottom of a canyon, you can always see it for yourself. Football channel, channel number 96249. I would rather do anything else in the world. But we have a mystery on our hands. Why is the field lined up wrong? Simple mistake or sabotage or what? If anyone has out there has any info that will let us crack this case, shoot us an email. We'd love to talk to you. Help us solve one of the greatest, dumbest mysteries of our time. So, that does it for this episode of Garbage Football. We'll be back on Tuesday, and don't forget, premium subscribers will get a bonus episode on Friday. I'm Foy. And I'm Roger. Peace. Outdoor recreation. If you go hiking to Horseshoe Bend, overlook. Off US 89, about two miles south. We perpetually hang out. I think scared is the word. I'm scared. How come? All people, all these people seem so normal. So much like I remember them being. In some ways, like they're broken. Do these people have jobs? Sure, some people have jobs they feel like it. It's natural for us, for you and me, to have a tough time understanding that. We're both projects of 20th century America. In that time, if someone had a job, it was their identity, it was their purpose. That isn't true anymore. I guess we're sort of like them. I think he, I know where you're going, but finish your thought. We don't do anything, right? There's nothing we're supposed to be doing? Nope. We completed our mission 15,000 years ago. So now we just hang out. We perpetually hang out. Who do you think was the first person to say hang out? Just like all the people down there. We shoot the shit and watch football and waste time. That's exactly it. That's the fate we share. Speaking for myself, that's the connection I share with them. I'm the least human thing you could imagine, but I feel like I'm them. I think I found it in the newspaper. Shrev Report says it. March 23, 1859. Your choice of words is interesting. Wasting time. Well, yeah. Those people in the canyon, they've wasted, what, 13,000 years playing a game they know nobody can win. The number of people... I, the people I remember would have quit in a week. Well, this is what I'd say to that. There's no indication that these people's lives will ever end. They never will run out of time. Wasting implies the consumption of something that you can't get back. They have an infinite supply of time. Can they ever really waste any of it? I guess that's one way of thinking about it. Still, I'm appalled. Disgusted, I guess, with that game in the canyon. They don't want to do anything else with their time. It's hideous to me. It's like, some of these people seem normal. The Drabos seem totally normal, like they were at a TV show or something. Those players in Arizona, it's like something is critically wrong with them. Like they've all gone crazy. I think they're doing the best they can with immortality. A human being will rarely admit this to you, but they tend to be terrified of living forever. They're born and raised with the understanding that their lives would end. They've achieved everything they've wanted to achieve, all the ills that plagued them, and now boredom's their only enemy. And they get up in the morning and fight it every day of their eternal lives. Recreation and play sustain them. Football sustains them. And if you find yourself in a football game with such a gargantuan task, that seems undefeatable, that will claim eons of your time and passion, I think that makes you one of the lucky ones. God damn. I know. Hey y'all, I found Nancy. Oh good, great. So, for all you guys tuning in, we, uh, Nancy McGunnell is totally AWOL. Whereabouts unknown. Yeah, whereabouts unknown. She was last seen today going up in the Twister, which is now confirmed EF5. Yeah, the weather service totally just confirmed it. A confirmed EF5 tornado. So she could have basically been carried anywhere between 10 and 15 miles away. And there are a couple things about that. She obviously could have been thrown in any direction. So maybe she's upfield somewhere more, uh, near Highway 34. Maybe she landed 
backwards towards Seward, although so far nobody in Seward has reported seeing her. And Seward's full of Iowa fans, so chances are if they saw her, they'd say something. Micah, how many tacklers are reporting for Iowa? Uh, I'm seeing... They're saying they have 70 defenders fanning out, plus the 11 they already had in play. So, 81. And on the radio, they said there's a search area of 600 square miles. they got to have way more tacklers than that. That's a tackler every... Uh, hold on. That's one tackler every 7.4 square miles. It's not even close to enough. Because the other thing is, what if she fumbled in the tornado? She probably did fumble. Yeah, and she probably did. It's got to be really hard to hold onto the ball in a tornado that strong. So, who knows? Maybe she has the ball, or maybe it's... You can turn it off. Just lying around in a field. Sure? Somewhere. If that's the case, they... Yeah, I'm sure. Thanks. We should tail her for a while and watch her. She probably has a better idea where the ball ended up than they do, so it'd be easier to just let her... <laughs> Sounds like a lot of them after you. There's gonna be a lot more, I bet. Can they do that? I don't really watch a whole lot of football these days. Yeah, they can, uh... Three times a game, if you just can't find the ball carrier in open field, you can go back to your state and call up for... Up to a thousand volunteer defenders. They've got two of those left. Oh my. Well, most of them aren't actual players. Usually they can round up a few retired players, but it's mostly just random folks. The volunteers are basically just eyes and ears. More often than not, they won't try to make the tackle themselves. Oh, you know what? I went on one of those volunteer players one time. Uh, it must have been, you know, I was married to Susan at the time. This must have been around, like, 12,500. It was a whole bunch of nothing, really. I remember they came into town like, hey, anybody wants to have some fun? They got a Minnesota player on the run outside Cedar Rapids. I think what they offered wasn't much, like $100 in a bus ride, so I said no thanks. That's it? I think they pay a lot more than that these days. Well, I should have taken it, because you know what happened the next day? County clerk shows up here in person, slaps an envelope right in the bar and says, Henry, I'm sorry to do this, but here's a summons to dress for Iowa and report to Cedar Rapids. So I head out there, mostly just wander around Lynn County with a flashlight, no idea what I was doing. Never saw the fellow who had the ball, I guess they caught him in a cornfield somewhere. Well, that's a shame. What I think is, if there's so little interest in the game that you need to be sending out summons, you shouldn't be sending out summons. I know it, I know it. I remember one time I ran into a volunteer tackler and he just asked for my autograph. <laughs> you signed it for him? I said, sure, what the hell, why not, you know? <laughs> Landed 6,270 6, yards northeast, retreated back field, 9,847 yards west. Uh, let me see what's on. I think Judge Mathis comes on at 8. Oh, I love him. Yeah, I like him a lot. He's my favorite out of all the Judge shows. You sure you want you want to stay put with everyone here after you? I'm Not that I'm hap not happy to have the company. I like where I am on the field right now. They're expecting me to move right now, so I'm going to sit here and sip a beer. And then around midnight, when they expect me to stay put, I'll move out. Which way are you headed? Straight east? Well, come on. I'm not going to tell you that. I've known you for about half an hour. <laughs> okay. Fair is fair is fair. I don't mean to be standoffish, I'm sure you're fine. But the next thing you know, tomorrow you could be making friends with someone from Iowa just as easy as you're making friends with me right now. You sure we haven't met before? Well, I don't know, have we? Well, you know what they're saying the other day on the news is, if you were born in 2000, you've been around for about 5 million days, I think it was. So even if you met up with just one new person per week, you could meet a million people, or something like that. I'm not some kind of math whiz, but the point is, by now you could have met just about everybody in Nebraska by now. I think I heard that. I've been teammates with a few folks who actually keep a diary of everyone they've ever met. Shoot, I'm thinking about it. I don't leave Seward County all that much. Tell you the truth, I could probably fit everyone I've met the last hundred years on a postcard. So I was living in B. What do you like about it? Well, there's not a lot to it. There's only about 40 people who live here. Farmers and their families mostly, but you see uh, right out the window there? Yeah, I was looking at that when I walked into town. That's kind of a funny looking building. Well, that is the B State's ballroom. You got a story. You got time? Uh, you got another one for me? Sure, another of the same? Perfect. Yeah, I'm with you there. When the rep comes by, he's always trying to sell me on all these, I don't know, these beers with chocolate and grapefruit and all these other flavors. Well, hell, I'm not trying to drink my dinner. <laughs> yeah, I know that much. I know that much. Thank you, sir. Well, I don't know if you remember the WPA, but it was a big work project put on the, by the government to give people jobs during the Great Depression. They'd go around and build parks and roads and who knows what else. All kinds of things. I remember that. It was a little before my time, but I remember my dad used to talk about it. He didn't think too much of it. He called it the, uh, what did he call it? Oh, he said the WA stand for whistle, piss, and argue. <laughs> I never heard that one, but yeah, I know some folks weren't really fans of it. Whistle, piss, and argue. But no, I don't think, it, I think it was a real good thing around here. So there was a bunch of Polish people living here in the 1930s, and one of them was uh, Vlad Sabotka. 
Uh, he was an architect in charge of WPA project to build sidewalks in town here, and him and his men did a real good job. A lot of the sidewalks are still in place, probably because they aren't used very often. Yeah, come to think of it, I didn't walk on the sidewalks to get here. I just walked down the middle of the street. Yeah, I guess the main reason you put down sidewalks is for kids to just don't run around in the middle of the street, and it's not like there's any kids around. So anyways, this fellow Sabatka and his workers finished the sidewalks way ahead of schedule, so they had nothing to do. And he wants to do all he can to make sure his men have work, and it turns out they still have a whole bunch of leftover materials, lots and lots of it. So he stays up all night and he draws up blueprints for this crazy 12-sided building. He drew it up all in one night? I think so. I have no idea how he came up with the idea. Maybe he saw a building like that before or something, but I don't know. I mean, he was just a guy in 1930s Nebraska. There wasn't a lot to look for, you know, inspiration. You know, I honestly just think he made it up out of nowhere. That's what caught my eye about it. It almost looked like some kind of weird spaceship in the middle of this little town. Dance to the Six Fat Dutchman, 30 o Thursday, October 31st, 1957. State's Ballroom, B, Nebraska. Kind of does a little bit. And, uh, what's the real wild thing about it is that they built the whole thing in a couple of weeks using nothing but sidewalk materials. The whole thing? Yeah, because when you lay down a sidewalk, you got to have wooden planks on the sides to kind of mold it in, in when you pour the concrete. So the whole thing's nothing but a bit of wood and a lot of sidewalk concrete. So it's a whole building made of sidewalk. Whole building, yeah. And I bet you there's not another building like it in the world. We got it right here in B. Significance. 1900 onwards. Architecture. Social, humanitarian, theater, other, specify. Recreation slash entertainment. Specific dates, 1938 to 40. Builder slash architect, Vladimir Sabodka. U.S. Department of the Interior Heritage Conservation and Recreation Service National Register of Historic Places Inventory Nomination Form. The hardest work I've ever done in my life was on the WPA. Hardest and heaviest work. A lot of what we built is still around. Walter Ballard, 1979. Come to think of it, I guess that's maybe a pretty boring story if you're not from... No, no, no. It's a beautiful story. I love it. I had the funniest thought up in that twister. Yeah? I was thinking... I have no idea where this thing's going to throw me, but I know I'm going to land on top of a story. I wonder if there's a single place in the whole world that's never had a story. I bet not. I just about guarantee you there's no places like that in America. Every little square of it, every place you stomp your foot, that's where something happened. Something wild, maybe something nobody knows about, but something. You can fall out of the sky and right into some forgotten storybook. You just run and run and run and keep turning pages and none of them are empty. They're all full of stories. There's nowhere left to write. I think I'm just a bookmark. Seems okay to me. You know what? Never mind. I have so many questions. Holy shit, what else is new? Why is everything the same? Why has everything been the same for 15,000 years? Buildings are the same, people do the same stuff, cars are the same. You look like a beer keg, except you're full of dumbass questions instead of beer. <laughs> well, you look like the inside of a Teddy Ruxpin. Juice, come on. I'm right, though. Look, it looks like a dog got hold of a Teddy Ruxpin and ripped its little ass up, and now all's left is a box and some wires and shit. But it's still talking and saying shit like, Hello, would you like to be my friend? What time is it? What are some colors? Let's play a game. Let's read a book. Will you be my friend? What are some fun shapes? You know what? Fuck you. Oh, shit. Oh, shit. I'm sorry. Nah, buddy. That ruled. I was wondering if you could even get mad. I'm sorry. Clowning is how I express affection. I'd say I need to take some time to unpack all that issue, but I've been in outer space doing jack shit for 15,000 years, so whatever. Is that the first time you've ever been mad? Uh, yeah, I guess so. How did it feel? Mad. <laughs> alright, alright, okay. So let's all do this. Nine, you've got some new feelings. Take a breather and process them. And then later, I promise, I'll be here to answer all your questions. In the meantime, Juice, maybe you can put on something light for us. Okay. As long as it's not... Game 27 it is! No! God, not Game 27. Seriously, can we not watch Game 27? Just for a little bit, I promise. <sighs> this game is trash. I hate it, I hate it, I hate it, I hate it. Hate it. Come on, we're gonna take the scenic route. Here we go through all the mountains. Wee! 
Come on, don't play with your food. <laughs> Here goes the airplane. Whoosh. <laughs> Roger, ground control. Requesting permission to land at the funnest game in the history of Earth. <laughs> yes, sir, Mr. Captain Juice. You and your weird shit bucket looking ass friends have permission to land. Hate you. Here comes, here comes, here comes. Almost there. Uh. Uh. What is. You know what? Never mind. Never mind. Okay, so the thing about this game is that you don't really watch it, okay? Because there's usually not any action in the traditional sense. It's like watching a galaxy from some far-off nebula. There are a million things to study, but things evolve far too slowly for to count as action on this scale of time. You could watch it for a week straight and realize that the whole time nothing resembling football actually happened. But you don't feel cheated, and why would you? How could you see this and feel cheated? Oh, look at you! You're using apostrophes! You're punctuating! Well, this is special to me. I feel like I'm one of the only true appreciators of this game, and the duty of introducing someone to it, I take very seriously. I could put on a tux if I would. I just metathesis the fuck out of that sentence, though. There are a lot of different ways to behold this game. I like to think of it as a rainbow of failed ideas. Some of these terrible ideas collapsed on themselves and disappeared. Some of these terrible ideas interacted with each other in any number of different ways. Some of these terrible ideas swallowed each other, le other less terrible ideas whole. We don't have the details of how exactly all this came to be. There are some things we know, and there's a lot of very safe guesses and projections. One thing we do know is that this was once an NFL game between the Denver Broncos and Pittsburgh Steelers. It almost certainly started in the 21st century, probably the 2080s or tw 2090s. Over the next... 15,000 years, the two-team system faded away. Outside teams, people, and interests began to, began to interfere in the game, eventually claiming territory. Any questions so far? Uh, can we change the channel yet? No. This game is divided into 58 territories. The Broncos and, Broncos and the Steelers each still have their own territory. Territory 1 is claim, claimed by the Broncos, who refuse to participate in any of this evolution. Their ter territory remains completely unaltered. Hash marks are freshly painted, and the players still show up every Sunday in helmets and pads. They insist, without any success, that the game return to how it used to be. A wall stands between their territory and the other, the our others, though no one for sure remembers who built it. This is territory. <laughs> okay. My god. The Steelers exist, but barely. Their territory, which once covered half the field, is now reduced to a single tiny corner. They would have disappeared from the field entirely were it not for the Broncos, who leveraged whatever political power they had to ensure their opponent was still in the game. There's one Steelers player who still comes back every 500 years or so. They call him the last Steeler. He just kind of drags a stool out there and sits for an afternoon and then leaves. Nothing much else for him to do up there in the corner, really. Thanks to all the development, he can't even see half the field. I guess he just feels like he should make an appearance every now and then. Territories 9, 8, 9, 10, and 11 were plotted out as an attempt to connect the Steelers and the Broncos, if they could still actually play some kind of traditional football game, but rules on top of rules on top of rules made that impossible. I'm not understanding how... Don't encourage him. No, 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 it's okay. How can I help you? Okay, well, I don't understand how an NFL game went from that to this. This started as a standard NFL game with 15-minute quarters and everything, right? Yes. The general consensus is that someone flipped some kind of switch in the rulebook, at this point, the NFL was about 150 years old, and over the years, the rulebook got larger and larger, became bloatless, bloated with endless addendums and conditions. Some were added to try to make the game more exciting, and others were added because a particular team or owner insisted. In a lot of cases, they just kept adding rules to properly define a certain element of the game. For example, how do you know if a player has control of the ball? I don't know. They're holding the ball and not fumbling it, I guess? You just sort of eyeball it, right? You don't conduct a geometric analysis of every biological vector in the location of quadrillions of atomic particles, right? You wouldn't, because having something is an artificial notion. It's a judgment call. If the NFL wanted to preserve what it was, it would have backtracked to that point. The referee should have been able to call the game as they saw and felt it. But instead, they tried to define what can't be defined without a supercomputer. They took the catch rule and tacked all kinds of conditions and notes and everything onto it. 
eventually the catch section was 50 pages long. And you can only have so many rules until some of those rules begin to contradict each other or stack on each other in different ways. What we believe happened is that during this game, one of the teams cited a constellation of rules from across the rulebook and used them to argue that they owned part of the field. And of course, once that became possible, the teams raced to lay claim to as much of the field as they could. I want to go back to the... Where is 8, 9, 10, and 11? I can't even fucking see it. Here they are. 8, 9, 10. But now there are 58 teams, not two. Yep. Before long, individual players found out they could also present legal arguments for splitting off, splitting off into their own factions. For one reason or another, some of them did. There were four teams, then seven, then 25. At one point, there were as many as 100. Some of these territories consolidated, and now there are 58. Territories 8 through 11 were originally one unified territory. A bureaucratic tug of war splintered them into narrow lanes, which were even further carved apart by interests that had nothing to do with the football game. You can see the remnants of the baseball diamond they once tried to build. Territory 13 is now home to some storage units. Territory 11 is the 49ers' attempt at some point in the 67th century to insert themselves as a third team. It's unclear why or what benefit that had served them. Uh, it's been lost to history. Territories 8, 9, and 10 are home to some housing units. They are mostly just rented to out-of-towners and whatnot. So this part has nothing to do with football. No, not really. I mean, they don't have a lot of trouble filling it up. People dig the novelty of spending the night in the middle of an NFL game. But tenants' rights do give them authority to make a play on the ball or something. I wonder what for. If they did get the ball, what they'd do with it? It's a good question. Probably to try scoring the Broncos or the Steelers' end zones, but the officials most likely wouldn't give them points. Hard to know, really. They could also try and score in one of the alternate end zones. See those? I was going to ask about those. Well, those were acquired by players who deserted from the old rosters and insisted on playing their own game inside a game. The, they thought it was hopeless to try to score a game as originally drawn up, but they still wanted to play, so they tried their best to grab a little land for... This is so fucking dumb. Own oh, end zones. But they couldn't acquire territory in between them, and those territories didn't like their players stomping about on their own fields. So that game's kind of not feasible these days, especially because they moved the Bojangles. Now Bojangles is right in the way. Whoa! I know! I thought it was crazy, too. Bojangles is pr primarily a southern chain. I never thought they would expand to Colorado. I firmly believe that on a long enough scale of time, we could even see a Kroger in Oregon. Krogan. Kroger? Never mind. I'm going to crash into the next asteroid I see. So, where's the ball? Well, that's the big question. Thanks to a tracking system, we know that the ball is still somewhere on the field, but precise tracking was disabled thousands of years ago. There are plenty of spaces for it to hide, but there are about 100 permanent residents in this field. One of them should have stumbled upon it by now. I think someone has the world's best hiding place and isn't saying a damn thing. To be honest, though, most of these territories don't even care where the ball is. For the most part, they... Wait, wait, this is... I don't understand why people would acquire territories in this field they don't even want to play. If a piece of property is valuable to someone, it's valuable to everyone. A lot of these territories are held by people holding out for a deal. Could be money, could be anything else. See Territory 58? 56? Thousands of years ago, it was far larger and more valuable territory. It was once the only access point to connecting Territory 17 and 104, which no longer exists. That territory was claimed by a contingent of fans who demanded that brown mustard be provided in the concession areas so that people still go to this game? Oh, for sure they do. They don't pack it in like they used to, but 75,000 people bought a ticket for this game back in 2080 or whatever. The stadium's generous re-entry policy lets them come and go. Any given time, there's probably a thousand people in the- Oh, come on, don't tell me that. You didn't know that? People sit in the stands and <laughs> watch this fucking crap? This garbage dump where nothing ever fucking happens? Oh yeah, Broncos fans are crazy. So anyways, the fans were like, we've got the most crucial territory on the field, give us some damn brown mustard or else. And stadium management came back with, we're always looking to give our fans the best fan experience, but unfortunately our vendors, whatever, whatever, so they were like, fuck it, and they made a lake out of it. That monument heavily influenced the geopolitical climate of sports authority field at Mile High for centuries. Indeed, is that a statue of Sir Walter Raleigh? Yeah. Why? Is there any explanation you would possibly find satisfactory? <laughs> no. I think I'm fascinated by this game. Yes! No! I really am. Like It's like, look at all the time it's taken to make this game what it is. People have spent forever arguing and negotiating. Wow, look at those skyscrapers. I didn't even ask about those. The resources poured into this field are unbelievable. They just work together. Think of the amazing game they could have made. They could have made something really cool, like some kind of wild maze or whatever. I don't know, but something that was 10,000 feet tall. But they didn't want that. 
I mean, maybe they do on some level. If they can't work together, it's hideous. Holy shit, I like you. That is exactly it. That is exactly it. Yo, Ten, I think I know why you hate this and I love it. I'll listen if you let me change the channel. Okay, but we're definitely going to watch more of it later, okay? Whatever. So, you know, you're American. You're from Florida. But built in California and launched from Florida. Right. So, I bet you see this and you think see a capitalist error. Capitalism gun run wild. Sure, it's too much salt in the soup. Capitalism can't be allowed to run the entire show. There has to be some sort of counterbalance. There isn't leverage on the ha behalf of the common good. This is what you end up with. If this game still had a central governing body, Nine is right, there could be something great. But it's a garbage dump. It's a failure. This is capitalism, you dunk. This is what it's supposed to be. This is how it ends. If there isn't... If it isn't there, it's only because it isn't there yet. It's like you're staring at a cake in the oven wondering if it's going to be a cake. Things went the other direction in America, and thank God for that. But capitalism deserves a zoo like this one. It's a beast of the wild, as wild as any grizzly bear with fawn's blood in its mouth. Do you think you see deeds and contracts and bureaucratic bloat and see something that went wrong? Something was always wrong, y'all. I love to watch it. Love it. In a zoo where it can't hurt me. And people are turning out. Tuning out. We're down to 106 listeners. People are listening to us? Like, people on Earth? Well, they were. Only 98 now. Thanks, Juice. Thanks for that. Well, when you talk to a 15,754-year-old spacecraft who was built in Toulouse, this is what the fuck you get. Sorry for being bored in French. Question time. You promised. I did. What a... Pioneer 9 action log. Questions to ask 10. Why hasn't human technology advanced in the last 15,000 years? Why aren't humans even trying to explore space? I know I already said that nobody knows why people stopped aging or dying or all of a sudden, but do you expect to ever know the answer? Are they seriously going to live forever for millions of years, trillions of years? Aren't they going to get bored eventually? Are they all in a simulation or something? Are they all in heaven or something? Do we Are we going to be stuck out here forever? Do they know we're out here? Has Juice always been like that? Why did it take you so long to wake me up? What about all the other countries? How come we're just watching America all day? How are they doing? Where did Florida go? How long have you and Juice been awake? There are some other space probes out there, and if so, did you talk to them? Have you seen any evidence of extraterrestrial life? How has the world changed politically? How are all the buildings in such good shape, even the ones that have been around since the 1800s and 1900s? How have state boundaries remained exactly the same for 15,000 years? How come people look like they're different ages? Shouldn't people look the same age? If crime's been eradicated, how come that police officer in Nebraska was necessary? Am I going to die? Should I have woken up? Why did you wake me up? I have an idea. Just take one off the top. Okay. Uh... Why hasn't technology advanced in the last 1,500 years? Thousand. Thousand years. You mean besides the nanos, right? Besides, you know, the brilliant nanotechnology that is omnipresent on Earth and has helped redefine human existence? Well, yeah, besides that. People mostly look and live like they always did. Now at Ron Farmer Chrysler Plymouth, Plymouth Voyager, all you add is people. Voyager holds up to 15 people, three more than Ford and Chevrolet. Repair Voyager, or go anywhere, do anything Voyager gives you the competition a dozen more. Ron Farmer's Auto Supermarket Incorporated. Super van selections from $43.90. Humanity could have advanced if it wanted to. In fact, it did. Almost everything you thought they would invent, they did. Flying cars, buildings that build themselves, jets that can take you from Arkansas to Paris in five minutes. You don't see any of those things because people didn't want them. If they advanced too much further technologically, technologically, those advances would inevitably intrude on our humanity. People wanted to walk. They wanted to take the bus that smelled like cigarettes. They wanted those precious three minutes between asking a question and knowing the answer. People defeated scarcity. Everyone had what they needed and nobody got sick, but they found that they needed things to just be a little bit difficult once in a while. They needed to stub their toe and wait in line to see that check engine light. They decided to leave their existence just a little short of perfect because they wanted to want. There's also something to be said for the mechanism of human change. It's largely generational. People's wants and hopes and dreams evolved because younger people entered the world and took another step forward. But this is the final generation. Yes, it's a 15,000-year-old generation, but just as you wouldn't expect them to grow a third arm, you shouldn't ex assume they want different things, different lives. They wanted things and they got them all. The end. This could have been observed in the years before people stopped aging. People sometimes talk about how their grandparents they knew in the 60s, 70s, 80s. They tend to talk about how the day-to-day -day sameness of their grandparents' lives. Their furniture is what interests me for specifically. It would never, ever be rearranged. 
Sofas and armoires would be shoved into the living room in 1955, and they would sit there unmoved until 1995, all the while their legs slowly digging themselves into the carpet. Plates and portraits would hang on the wall for eons, and when you took them down, they would leave unbleached shadows of themselves in the paint. It would have been so simple for them to rearrange their things. To me, it seems so likely, almost to the point of certainty, that at some moment within those 40 years, they might want to. But they never did. They never even thought to. And why would they? Things were just the way they wanted them. Of course, humans could, at any time, introduce things to make their lives more efficient. But when we consider post-scarcity humanity, we must also note that time is no longer scarce. Efficiency is meant to save time, but time is infinite. Why try to save something you have an infinite supply of? You may as well tell them to dig up dirt and hoard it in boxes. You haven't been awake for long. I think you underestimate how exhausting it is to think big. You can only hold grand ambitions above your shoulders for so long before you get tired. They got tired. Some lasted longer than others, but they all got tired. Now they're resting in a moment that will last until the end of time. Sales of its soon-to-be-continued Plymouth Voyager minivan fell 32% November, while sales of the more expensive Chrysler Town & Country drove, rose 29%. 1992 Plymouth Voyager, $950 on cars.com. Why don't they go to space? Look at your te telemetry data. How long have you been in space? Um, 15,807 years, 255 days, 8 hours, 4 minutes. Approximate. Approximate. You can approximate. No one's checking your work anymore, okay? Ba how fast are you traveling? About 12,000 miles an hour. How far are you from Earth? Uh, I guess I fell out of orbit in 1983 and uh, about 1.6 trillion miles. And what's your trajectory? I'm headed roughly in the direction of the Andromeda system, which is extraordinarily lucky for you. Andromeda is the nearest major galaxy, and you've been chucking towards it at 12,000 miles per hour for 15,000 years. How long before you reach it? Uh, I'm 0.00001% of the way there. 1% of the way there? That's not even... No, no, not 1%. 0 0.0001. Oh, so that's a hundred thousandth of a percent. So that means I'll get there in 145 million years. 145 million years. Remember when I woke you up? That took, what, 30 years? You, a machine with infinitely greater patience than a human being, almost went insane. Uh, they could go faster than I am, though. Way faster than 12,000 miles an hour. The absolute speed limit humans discover to themselves, or anything they create, is exactly, like, 503,772 miles per hour. So, yes, a lot faster than you, but nowhere even close to the speed of light. If they could actually sustain that speed permanently, which they couldn't, they would reach the nearest galaxy in 3.5 million years. I'm sure they could go faster than that, though. They could figure it out. They went from winged fight to space travel in 60 years. You keep doing this. Doing what? Assuming that time guarantees something. That infinite time equals infinite everything. It doesn't. Half a million hour miles per hour is the ceiling. People spend ages bumping up into that ceiling. It cannot be moved. Well, they've got to keep trying. It's their purpose. They have to see what's out there. They have all the time in the world to figure out some kind of solution. They have to keep trying. Can't just stop here. The stars must ex- Why? Consider why you want this. People have found their home in their eternity. This is their final state. Wait, where are we going? Up here, dummy. Uh, the readability of this is kind of... Shut the fuck up. Okay. As I was saying, people have found their home in their eternity. They decided that this is their final state. Humans were once conquerors and explorers. This w That was their embryonic stage, a stage which is now finished. They tried to explore a space. Early efforts resulted in, well, you and me. Later, they built the Hubble telescope. Hubble, say hi. Hey. Speak up, we can barely see you. I'd rather not. I'm watching a game. You're being you're being rude. Nine just woke up. Come on. Congrats. What? Congrats. Thanks. Back to the game. You guys have fun. Hubble doesn't talk much, but he gave people stunning images of the cosmos, an endlessly bright and colorful universe for us to explore and conquer. It didn't turn out that way. Humanity tried to send themselves to other solar systems, and 3143 they succeeded and found nothing. Nothing interesting. A bunch of planets full of rocks and gas. Then they deployed probes to visit other stars in the Milky Way galaxy. You know how many stars are around the galaxy? There are 250 billion. Specifically, there are 250 billion to 880 million 113,002 stars. 
You have to use a minimum of 900 pounds of metal to build a deep space probe. So if you want to send one to each star, that's nearly 120 billion tons of metal. That demonstrates the enormity of the galaxy, yes? We can't visit each star because we literally don't have enough stuff to build it. We couldn't mine that much without seriously damaging our planet or another planet. So we built what we could and we sent them out there. They found not even the slightest, nothing, even the slightest bit interesting. Everything was as we guessed it was when we saw it through the telescopes. It was the grandest anticlimax imaginable. It shattered what people thought of themselves and their destinies. The letdown was, in itself, a sort of brilliant wonder of its own. The space probes are all out here. We'll st we're still out here, ready to tell ground control if we see something. That's a fantasy, because we probably won't. And if we do, it'll be on a scale of time so impossibly vast that it may as well be never. People had a choice. They could continue wandering through the endless darkness and absence of everything they loved, an endless void of disappointment and loneliness. Or they could look down and embrace what they always had and loved. An answered prayer. Struggle. True, unfabricated struggle. It's a cocoon they've shed. Humans are beings of the land and sea who've refused to cast themselves into the cosmic zoo. Exploration and conquest are meaningless. They've achieved their final form and they're resting in an eternal moment. They're creatures of play. They'll be creatures of play until the end of time. I don't know. Are you okay? I don't care. Ten give you the talk? Yeah. How you doing with it? I don't know. You, uh, you want to watch some football? Yes. What kind of game you want to watch? I don't know. Are you okay? I don't care. Okay, so how about if we do a fun one? This is one of my favorites. You know what 500 is, right? 500 what? Like, 500 the game. Probably. Uh, well, so basically someone puts a ball up in the air and then calls it how many points it's worth. Like 100 or 200 points or whatever they feel like. And then whoever catches it gets that number of points. And if you get 500 points, you get to be the one who throws it. That's the classic version, but in this version, the ball's about two feet wide. It's got a steel frame and it's weighed down, weighs like 120 pounds. It's shot out of a cannon from the top of a mountain that basically can launch the ball anywhere on the continent. And there's like thousands of people playing at any given time. Wait, that sun was just setting. Is it rising again? Yeah. What happened to it? What happened to the sun? <laughs> Nothing. It's Alaska, dumbass. Denali Canyon, pastel on canvas, Nancy McGunnell, February 6820. So basically they got this cannon, right? It's one of the most powerful cannons ever built. All it does is shoot footballs. In the 6000s they built it to put on top of Denali and ever since it 
Wait, I don't have any record of Denali. My onboard scratch data lists this as Mount McKinley. Well, that's because your scratch data was wrote by dickheads. It's called Denali. You don't get to have the highest point in North America named after you just because you were president. Do you have any idea how many presidents there's been? Uh, that's one of the questions I didn't get around to asking yet. The current president is your 3,831st president. So, like, 1 in 85,000 people in America were president at some point. By that ratio, there are 15 former presidents living in, living in Indianapolis alone. So, who gives a shit, right? Anyways, this is the Denali Canyon. Sometimes it's called the 500 Canyon because it's been used to play 500 games for thousands of years. The operator loads it up with a football, yells at a point value, aims it, and fires the ball somewhere in the contiguous United States. And then, whoever recovers the ball gets the points. You don't gotta catch it, you just gotta be the first to get to it. If you do, you get however many points the ball's worth, and if you ever get to 500 points, they fly you up to Alaska and you get to be the operator. How do they decide where to shoot it? All depends. Sometimes the operator will be on some engineering genius shit and require account for wind patterns and all that bullshit, and the best ones could seriously fire it from a mountain in Alaska and drop into a kiddie pool in the middle of Arkansas. Usually, if it's someone like that, they become the operator because they took a real scientific approach trying to get the 500 points in the first place. Like, they keep track of all the locations where the balls hit the ground, they map it all out and try to recognize patterns. Maybe the pattern's something real simple, like the operator's just trying to draw a smiley face in the middle of Kansas. Or maybe it's something way more complicated, like trying to the, encrypt the Fibonacci sequence in a series of coordinates, that kind of thing. Or maybe there's just no pattern at all. Happens all the time. Some dumbass will be out in a field just fucking about and he sees a ball drop out of the sky. They weren't even playing, they just got lucky. So they go get the ball and call the cops. Cops tell them to call the league office. Da 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 da. They're the operator. Free trip to Alaska and unlimited meal vouchers. I mean, shit. And when people like people like that, when the landing locations have no pattern, those are the real fun ones. Honestly, those are the ones I like. God bless those folks. They don't even know what the fuck they're doing. They just sit at the controls and dick around with the knobs and buttons until it goes kaboom. Lord knows where the ball's actually going. June 17, 776 leaderboard. Rika Matsoda, 340. Shariah Bishop, 300. Celine Vandermeer, 186. Sean Rowe, 185. Paul Wade, 180. Ellie Simmons, 100. Paul Eldridge, 120. And Reynald Raya, 158. If allied, 178. 17th place. Tied between Dion Cunningham, Julian Dem, Rafiq Mooney, Hudgen Song, Randy Donnelly. One point. The bookie says... Don't bet on more falls in Oregon. The operator was clearly trying to hit a specific target, perhaps in Boys Yard, Idaho, as four balls left the, fell in the vicinity in the first week, but seems to have moved on to other pursuits. ID4 is swamped with players looking for an easy score. Don't be one of them. Find a part of the country where you won't have so much competition. Do consider staking out Missouri. The, this operator seems to largely fire off footballs at random, and no operators have fallen in Missouri in mo months. Re regular readers of this column can say it along with me. Random operators love to evenly distribute. If there's part of the map without a big red X on it, that's where they like to shoot the ball. Why? Well, that's a question for the shrink. As for your humble bookie, well, Missouri is ta untapped territory with a relatively extensive highway grid that makes just about every corner of it accessible by motor vehicle. Tracking the ball should be easy. Do keep an eye on Lake Sacramento. Interested little insider info from your dear bookie? I thought you were. The operator went to high school in what used to be Modesto, where the roofs of a lot of the buildings still peek above the waterline. If you want to sneak out there to wait for a football, but you don't want a ta any tag along stealing your big idea. Pick up a John boat and a couple of paddles of, from a dealer of, west of Oakdale. Then just paddle your quietly paddle your way out there and get ready to catch a ball next time the operator is feeling sentimental. It's <laughs> incredible. Really? Because I don't know if I. Huh. You know what? What? A few minutes ago, my whole universe was spinning. All that stuff 10 told me. I just couldn't make sense of it. And I still can't. I don't think this is helping me do that at all, but I do feel better. Thanks. <laughs> well, if you ask me, that's what all these games are for, you know? Because, I mean, I know what you mean, right? Because I've been thinking about it for thousands of years and I still get fucked up about it. The idea that play is the point of existence now. And I can't really wrap myself around that, so I find a game to watch. It's like, the point of play is to distract yourself from play being the point. <laughs> uh, yeah. Okay, let's just workshop that. Yeah, I'll work on that one a little bit, maybe. Okay, so, okay, so yeah, I think I disagree with you. It seems like this game would be far more interesting with some sort of method or strategy to where the ball's fired. Otherwise, I mean, it's basically like playing the lottery, isn't it? Yep, I got two answers to that. First is, don't talk shit about the lottery, the lottery rules. Second is, if you ask me, there's a scarcity of uncertainty on Earth. I mean, what are you going to do if you find out you're going to live forever and you're never going to live on another world? And you're never going to see heaven or hell, or you're never going to be a cyborg with laser cannons for arms and shit. Your finished form is the one who mows the lawn. You sort of snap back into that so your life can be defi de defined somehow. 
all the while ignoring all the loose change of uncertainty that's still lying around. You know, there's still some spots in the continental United States no being has ever stood. You know that? Wait, where? There's a couple hundred places out in the wilderness, like up in Montana and Wyoming, where you could draw a circle with a 50-foot radius and say, no human has ever walked in that circle. Unvisited territory number 238. No way, there's so many cross-country football games going on. One of them had to pass through them. Nope. There's still 8 million people on Earth, and literally nobody even- Wait, how many did you say? 8 million? Million. Million. Billion. Wait, no, 10 said million. Oh my god. Wait, so there are 8 billion people, not 8 million? Yes, million with a B. Wait, million or billion? Billion. Billion. God damn, the big one. The one that's bigger. Billion. The number there should be. Okay, god. Ten thinks she's so smart, and then she up and kills almost 8 billion people with a typo. I'm gonna give her so much shit. Well, that's good news. Yeah, lord help us. Okay, okay, anyway, so... America's got about 300 million people in it. They've been bumbling about America for 15,000 years, and none of them have even bothered to walk in these unvisited places. And on one hand, why would they? Because there's nothing special there. But on the other hand, why wouldn't you? That's incredible. Oh, you think that's incredible? There's a few spots I've tracked in populated, place, populated places where basically nobody's ever walked. Like, this one is one of my favorites. In suburban Chicago, there's this office park. It's one of those office parks you see all over the place that has a pond next to it for some reason. It's not a real pond, it's just a hole they dug and filled with water and stocked with fish. No one knows why. Nobody fucking goes fishing there. These ponds never have names. They're probably the only bodies of water in America that don't have names. That's how little they matter. I watch ponds like those a lot. They fascinate me. Once every couple of years, I'll see some overworked office employee walk down to the water's edge, just kind of stand there for a minute. That's it. They don't love it like they would a real pond. It's like trying to show a dog its reflection in the mirror. It doesn't give a shit. It knows it's not real. You know what really gets me? Hey, sorry if I'm boring you. I just feel like I'm going on and on. You're not boring me. I like you. What really gets me is the space just on the back side of this particular office park. It's this long and narrow lawn right next to the buildings. There's a sidewalk nobody ever walks on. Like, honestly, someone uses that sidewalk every 30 or 40 years. This is what I call a forgotten lawn. During the warm months, some dude will come and cut the grass on a riding lawn mower now. With a lot of forgotten lawns, every few decades the mower will break down or there'll be some giant stick and they have to go off the lawn mower and go throw it into the bushes. Not here. Not this lawn. They laid down the grass in 1999. In the 15,777 years since, nobody has ever directly stepped on it. You can't really know that. I can. I've done lots of detailed geological studies dating back to the years before I woke up. This lawn is right next to a sidewalk. It's a few feet from a feeder road and a few more feet from an expressway, and right next to it there's a six-story building full of people doing this, that, and the third. But they've never walked over here. Nobody has. That's one reason I love 500 so much. Do me a favor and crunch the odds real quick of a 500 ball ever landing on this lawn. Uh, this lawn's about .0006 square miles. Lower 48 in the United States takes up about 3.1 million square miles, so I guess the basic odds are 1 in 5.2 billion. And 500 balls are shot out of the cannon roughly once a day, so... So, a ball will hit this lawn once every 14 million years. There's gotta be some other reason that would bring a person to walk around that lawn more often than that. Well, if you can think of one, let me know. Personally, I've seen enough. It's like washing the Earth orbit the sun and going like, maybe this time it will go in a square instead of an oval. Nah. You know who would've wandered out there just to do it? Children? Children. No, 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 no. Am I interrupting? Yep. You know the cannon's about to fire, right? Wait, like now? Yes, like now, now. Like in 60 seconds. Oh, hell. Come on, switch it to the cannon. Okay, okay, hold up. Come on, go, 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 go! Oh my god, hold up, I don't do good under pressure. Just give me a sec. Okay, but we're gonna miss it. You are not helping. Okay, uh, here we go. Did... Did you just search for tall shit? Tell me the truth. No. Yes. Sorry. Oh my god. Okay, wait, wait, wait. I got it. Finally. They declared points for this yet? Yep, this one's 188 points. So, whoever gets th this ball gets 188 points? Why 188? The operator's been a pretty arbitrary. Honestly, I think he's getting bored. Usually, if an operator shoots a ball worth more than 50 points, they just don't want to be operator anymore. Any guesses, y'all? I'm guessing it lands in Missouri. Drop that shit in the Ozarks, that'll take days to find. 
Okay, I'm gonna say a big city. Minneapolis. Maybe shoot it right through a high-rise window. See if any of those stiffs will call off work and pick up a football. Nine, how about you? No wrong answers. Um... Florida, like, near Orlando. Ha, <laughs> Florida, huh? Oh, come on, mine's new at this. What's wrong with Orlando? Uh, look at a map, Florida is, shh, it's about to fire. Oh, shit, here we go. Here we go, come on, big money, big money, big money. Well, we were all wrong. It's heading towards the west coast. Oregon? Nah, it's got too much zip on it. Shit, if it doesn't slow down, it's gonna fall in the ocean. Or like Sacramento. Wouldn't mind that. It's only like 10 meters deep most places. If it hits the floor, it wouldn't be too tough to dig up. It might make for a good naval battle. Wait, no. It's headed for San Fran. See? Livermore? Oh yeah, Livermore. Just a little bit east. Oh no. It's... Looks like it's gonna drop near the... Oh my god, no. Is it gonna drop near the... It's headed for the bulb. No, come on. It's not gonna hit the bulb. It's headed right for it. No. No, no, no. Someone has to stop it. We have to stop it. How are we gonna stop it? Uh, what's the bulb? Aw, oh, man. Oh, fuck. Aw, oh, man. This isn't happening. No. I can't look at this. No, 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 no. Come on. No. No! I'm sorry, one moment. No worries, just order whenever you're ready. Thank you. Okay, so if I get... I'm sorry, I'm taking up all your time. No, it's fine, there's no one behind you. Okay, okay, cool. So, it looks like the burger comes with pickles, but the chicken sandwich doesn't. And I want pickles, but y'all's burgers are kind of bad. Oh yeah, our burgers are fucking terrible. <laughs> right? And whatever I got... What I never got is, why are y'all call, called Burger King if the burger's the worst thing on the menu? <laughs> That's a good question. Real good question. Because, like, your fries are really good. And I like your chicken sandwiches. And you got the best breakfast sandwiches, probably, besides Sonic. And the thing is, the rest of the burger, besides the actual patty itself, is good. Yeah, you know what I do is, on my lunch break, I'll just make a burger with everything except the patty. So it's really basically just a veggie sandwich with pickles, tomato, lettuce, and ketchup, and mayo. It's good. <laughs> and I bet you get that for free. Even though the patty's free, you're like, uh, no. Yeah, no, I don't fuck with the patty. I want to know what executive at Burger King looked at, you know, those little pads you stick under the table legs so it won't scratch the floor. Who saw one of those and was like, I want to eat that? <laughs> it doesn't taste like anything. It's not even a color. Burger meat's supposed to be brown. That shit is gray. I don't want to eat any shit that looks like dishwater. Honestly, if you just handed me one of y'all's burger patties, it wouldn't occur to me to even eat it. I'd turn around and start washing the dishes with it. <laughs> Stop. Oh my god. Like, hold on, let me borrow this and go scrub the mold off the hole in my fucking boat. <laughs> yeah, you made ground beef that made its own snot. My lord, I fucking skipped. 15,000 fucking years and you can't even make the thing you named yourself after? Like, don't get me wrong, I'm no chef. I'm on the road all the time. I haven't made myself a home-cooked meal in years. But I could at least make a burger that doesn't have its own fucking burger stuck to it. The goop. Yeah, I call it the goop. You're talking about the little crater things on all the patties, right? Yeah, you make ground beef that made its own snot. <laughs> My lord, it's too much. I'm gonna eat that? It's bad, it's bad, I know. I'm sorry, you're probably like, who's this lady going on and on in my drive through line? <laughs> no, it's okay, trust me, trust me. This is the highlight of my day. Okay, so, lunch. Can I get the mm, number seven combo with the grilled chicken sandwich, but can you put pickles on it? And instead of a Coke, just a water. Can do. Anything else? No, that's all for me. You want any money? Uh, yeah, actually, that'd be good. Can I get $20 from you? Can do. Your total is seven seventy three, so minus the 20, I'll have $12.27 for you. Oh, you know what? I don't want to carry all that change. I'll just have $27.73, please. Sure. So, minus the total, I'll have an even $20 bill for you. Just pull around to the second window. Thank you. Okay, so here's your $20. Thanks. You sure? Oh, yeah, we got a couple hundred bucks in the door. We're good. And uh, here's your sandwich and the fries, uh, ketchup's in the bag. Hey, you're, uh, um, uh, oh god, I know you. Uh, Evans, Evans, right? Lucretia Evans, 5'6", 145 pounds, born 1992, Macon, Georgia. Lucretia served as the United States Speaker of the House between 5880 and 5886. That's me.
damn, you're famous. I was just talking to you for like five minutes. I didn't even know it. Nah, I'm nobody. I'm nobody. So you like playing right now? Technically, yeah. I still got to eat though, you know? Sure, I guess so. Seems like this would be kind of a weird place to post up in a 500 game. Don't most of those balls fall closer to the middle of the country? They do. I, I don't know. I'm trying something different. I guess you have to, right? You know what? I do. I really do. <laughs> I'm sorry. That's kind of shitty. Don't be. Don't be sorry. The Sports Writers Guild of America proudly presents the 1776-500 Game Scouts Guide, featuring full reports on all 17,834 registered players, maps of all 17,775 ball drop locations, and special retrospective, who's the greatest operator in the history of the game. And here is the Lake Sacramento, the flooded Mississippi, and the sunken east coast with Florida almost entirely disappeared. Lucretia Evans, the lovable loser. There's a saying in 500 circles. If you're anywhere near Lucretia Evans, you're in the wrong place. That saying's about 10,000 years old, and it's about as true in 1776 as it was in 1771, the year Evans first registered to play in the Genali 500 game. Since that day, 6,880,129 balls have fired out of Denali came into the lower 45 United States. Had she an average amount of luck, Evans should have caught at least 300 footballs right now. By now. She doesn't. In fact, her luck is so staggeringly pitiful that it's attracted the attention of mathematicians and sports historians alike. Lucretia Evans has never caught a single 500 ball. If she waits for the ball in Vermont, it lands in Oklahoma. She sets up camp in her native Georgia, it's bound to land in Washington State. In any given game, there are anywhere between 15,000 and 20,000 players. All of them have a chance. All of them, it seems, but Evans, whose absolute futility has made her a sort of celebrity. Every few hundred years, a late-night talk show host will rediscover her and make her the butt of a dozen jokes. The next week, you can count on Evans herself to sit in as a guest and join in on some of the self-effacing humor. Those close to her, though, say it does hurt. She wants to win, says Tracy Nichols, her coach. She laughs because what else is she going to win but laugh? I mean, she's been out there playing longer than almost any other player, but they've all caught dozens, hundreds of balls. She's all absolutely pissed off. Absolutely. She's hurt. She doesn't get it. None of us do, but she's too proud to stop. She'll play 100,000 more years if that's what it takes to catch a ball. That much, I guarantee you. Can I ask you something? You can ask me if anything you want. Trust me, you're not going to hurt my feelings. <laughs> okay. Why, uh, why do you keep trying? You haven't scored a single point in like 10,000 years, right? The short answer is that it's something to do. Well, I guess if long answer starts like this, I feel really lucky that it's taking this long. Like, you ever heard the joke, if you could get dressed up for your own funeral, how would you dress? I don't know. Very slowly. Okay. Okay. No, but it's kind of like that. It is like that to me. Uh, oh, you got a straw? Oh, sure. If this sounds scripted, it's because it is. I'm not usually this together. I've just had this conversation more times than I can count. A long, long time ago, I realized something about myself. I always have to have some kind of goal to work toward. It doesn't matter how stupid or trivial there is. There just has to be a well-defined objective with a clear delineation between success and failure. It's a fucked up thing about me. I wish it wasn't this way, to be honest with you. It, it'd make living forever a lot easier. Yeah, yeah, objective syndrome, I think is what it's called, right? Mm hmm I try to manage it as well as I can. I try to talk to my sister a lot. We're total opposites. You know what she does every day? She wakes up, she walks around the block, gets breakfast, takes care of her garden, works out, volunteers at the law firm for a few hours. Then she'll spend hours cooking dinner. Like she'll make consomme or something, and it just takes forever. Then she watches a few episodes of Law & Order, drinks a glass of wine, goes to bed. Every day. Every day is the exact same. She's done the same thing for 5,000 years straight. Wow, Law & Order is good for that, though, at least. I know, I know. There's like 400 episodes of it. Yeah, I read something about that. Like, how there's so much of it that as long as you don't really try to memorize the episodes, it takes so long to watch each one, but by the time you start over, you're not going to remember how each one went. Right. Yeah, the trick is to watch them out of order, so you can't really place yourself in the show's timeline. Lawn out of order. Lawn out of order. Shit. Yeah. But, so anyways, my sister just does the same thing every single day. It's some kind of zen shit she's figured out or something. She's like, keeps me level. That's all I need. But I can't, just can't do it though. If I wake up with some, without some big dragon to go and kill, I get like, I get scared. It's like I'm being buried alive or something. Man. The thing is, I do that while completely knowing that this game is dumb. I could wake up tomorrow and catch a ball worth 500 points. So, okay, and? Then what? 
maybe I'll get in the Hall of Fame and I get on TV, and then what after that? But it's like, on some level, I ha still have to grab onto that. I still have to have a mission, any mission, the harder the better. And that's why I count myself lucky that it's turning out to be so hard. So do you even want to catch the ball? I do and I don't. Clearly, I do and I don't. I mean, I don't want this to end, but also, if I'm not trying, actually trying my best to get one, the entire house of cards I built for myself just kind of blows over, doesn't it? I gotta wake up every day, stake out some land, keep maintaining this, I don't know, work of fiction. I'm, I think your phone's ringing? Oh yeah, it's my coach. Well, I can leave you alone. I'm not worried about it. I guarantee it's about the publisher. She keeps wanting me to write a book. It's all she talks about. Ah, so she's more of an agent, I guess? A little bit, yeah. That's really exciting. What, a book? Nah, that's really nice of you to say. Aw, oh, you should write one. I'd read it. Nah, they're too long. It's basically asking someone to pay 15 bucks on the other side of a one conversation that goes on for days. You gotta be a total asshole to want to write it. Kreisha, pick up, goddammit, call me back! Ah, shit. Okay, I'd better get to this and hit the road. Listen, it was really nice to meet you. You too. When your book's out, you gonna send me a copy? <laughs> yeah, okay. In about a million years. I'll be here. I'm sure you will. I'm sure you will. All right. Dial Tracy. Lacrota's Ford Focus is not connected to any devices. Ah, shit. To sync via Bluetooth, enter the Preferences menu on your device and... Okay. Select Lacrota's Ford Focus. Okay, girl. Jesus Christ. Ready to pair. Connected to Lacrota's phone. Dial Tracy. Dial Tracy. Lacrota's phone disconnected. Connected to Lacrota's phone. Lacrota's piece of shit phone disconnected. Lacrota's Ford Focus is not connected to any devices. Ready to pair. To sync via Bluetooth, enter the ah, preferences menu on your device and select Lacrota's Ford Focus. Connected to Lacrota's phone. Dial tra Lacrota's phone disconnected. Fuck! Connected to Lacrota's phone. Dial Tracy. Dialing Tracky. <laughs> Finally, oh my god. Trace, listen, if this is about the book, I don't want... There's a ball incoming. Damn, I wasn't even looking at the canyon schedule. Canyon schedule. You know I'm in Bay Area, right? Yes, where are you right now? Um, I'm a little south of San Ramon. I was about to get on the 580 uh, exit at 48. Okay. Oh god, Kreisha, you're like right on it. It's gonna land close. <sighs> Alright, what's my success probability? I'm gonna need at least 5% to go chasing after it. I literally just stopped to get some lunch. 99.98%. No. Lucretia. Lucretia, this is it. Oh my god, oh my god. Give me a route. You said you're on the 580? Take that. About to be. Okay, take 580 east. You don't need to speed. Don't speed. Okay. Tell me what you're looking at. The ball should be making impact with the ground in about three minutes. It's hitting Livermore, you can just about guarantee that. The player nearest to you is in San Jose. Oh god, you got daylight. He's a, like an hour away at the minimum. This one is all yours. Okay. Now, listen. There's a real good chance it's going to hit a building. This model of football is about 200 pounds, so if it does, it's almost sure to crash straight through the roof. This could land in someone's living room, and if it does, that's private property. You're going to have to ask nice if you want that ball. How many friends do you have in Livermore? Uh, let me check. Don't, 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 don't. Just don't look at your screen while you're driving. That's what I'm here for. All right, all right. You've got about 18,000 friends in Livermore, is that right? Yeah, but I haven't talked to a lot of them in a long time, like a thousand years. Should be fine. You're a celebrity, you know? You should be okay. Plus, the city drops are so rare, I bet one of them will be just happy to be a part of it. Ah, oh, shit. What? Shit, I've got cops on me. Were you speeding? I don't know, I don't think so. I'm checking it out. Hold tight. What the fuck? Trace, there's like 12 cop cars. I can't get over, they won't let me. Oh shit, it's a motorcade. Oh, that's just my luck, of course. The president or some shit like that is here. If I get stuck in this shit and it costs me the ball, I'm gonna... No, no, Kreisha, they're here for you. This is your motorcade. They called it for you. Me? Girl, you're all over the news. I. Uh, they're like, you're breaking news. I'm going through the channels right now. You're on NBC. It looks like they're showing some interview you did. Oh, that's some old footage of you. Oh, Jesus. You're wearing a pantsuit. This is from like 12,000. <laughs> what the fuck are you doing wearing a pantsuit? Lucretia? Lucretia. It's ending. This is the ending. It's over. Well, not yet it ain't. Looks like they just upped your success probability to 99.9%, .9%, but that ain't 100. 
We do need to talk strategy as long as we have a couple minutes, though. I think in the future we need to stake out peninsulas like this one because, I mean, look, this is low-value real estate. Nobody else wanted to be here because it's at the edge of the target area surrounded by water. So, yeah, it's garbage land, but you've got it almost all to yourself. There's like 17,000 people in this game, and right now you're one of the only three in the entire peninsula. Three! The more I think about it, the more I think this is just the start. This is just the start. we got a strategy now. You know what we're doing now? I'm telling you, I know this ball's under 188 points, but I'm telling you, you need to start thinking about what you're going to do when you're sitting up there in Alaska shooting that cannon. When What you want to do, what kind of game you want to create, and plus, before that, we've got to figure out a press tour. If you want to even do one, it's up to you, but I mean, shit, you're basically on every channel right now. Please be quiet. How are you doing? I'm, like, shaking. My hands are shaking. Just drive steady. Drive steady. You're fine. This is what you worked 10,000 years for. The, this moment you're in right now. Enjoy it. Just enjoy it. I'm trying to. Shit. Okay. It hit. It hit. It hit. It's on the ground. Getting... Give me a route. Getting it now. Getting you a route. Just, just a sec. Where are you on 580? About to pass exit 54. Get off. No, no, no. Okay. Hang a right. You want to find East and Loyola. Got it. You got it? Yeah. You're like two minutes away. God, look at these crowds. I'm seeing it. One of the local stations is a chopper. I'm looking at you right now. Oh, hey, I got the good news. The ball hit a fire station. That's a public building. No rights to negotiate. Nothing. You should just be able to walk right in there and drag it away. Just, uh, this is just silly. I don't deserve this. Huh? It's got some kind of landmark designation. I mean, it's a fire station. I don't know why it has that. My maps are probably fucked up or something. Anyway, all these people are out here for little old me. Shit. Looks like I hit the roof of the southeast corner of the building, crashed right through the roof. That took most of the wind out of it. Might be dug just a little bit in the concrete, but it won't be buried. Shouldn't have trouble getting getting to it. Just pull it right up to the garage. garage. Oh my god, Lucretia, this is really happening. This is really finally happening for us. No other player within 20 miles of you. You got it. You got it. Okay, okay. I think I'm allowing myself to be happy. <laughs> there you go. There you go. God, I'm crying a little bit. I think I'm still in sh shock too much for that. I'm just happy I could drive state straight. Okay, I'm about here. What the hell? What? I just turned the corner. People are running out of the fire station. Some of them are yelling. They're pissed off about something. They're mad? Seems like it. It's broken! It's broken! It's gone! Went right through the roof. Right, just went right through it. Oh my god. Oh my fucking god. Tracy, what are they talking about? This should have been impossible. It was protected. I thought they made it protected. I'm looking. Can they save it? Can they keep all the pieces together? Maybe they can save it. There's nothing to save. Look for yourself. It's just gone. There's nothing left. Oh, no. 1980, 1901 light bulb still burning. Livermore, California. A light bulb put into service in the 1901 Livermore Fire Department is still burning after having been rarely turned off. By today's standards, it should have burned out 852 times. The hand blow bulb has a thick carbon filament. Livermore light bulb. Livermore, California. In 1789... We get 700, 800 hits a week, Brandel says. People log on and watch the light bulb for several minutes as if it's going to do something, the department chief adds. One critic sent an email grousing, It's a light bulb, get a life. Geesh, you're sitting where surfing the web for a light bulb and you tell us to get a life? Brandel notes. Eulogy. We're here in remembrance of the Livermore light bulb. It was manufactured in the late 1890s in Shelby, Ohio, and installed in Livermore, California in 1901. In 1976, it was briefly shipped off when it was relocated to a fire station on East Avenue. 2013, a mishap again cut its power supply, but it successfully switched back on and remained on until being crushed by a 500-pound football on July 3rd, 1776. It was 15,875 years old. The Livermore light bulb probably did not have a soul. It was largely glass and filament through which electricity ran did not know us and it did not know its own royalty. It was the oldest functioning electric being in the known universe. It was our dearest ancestor. Year over year, century over century, it continued to astonish us. It was, after all, a light bulb that stayed on for more than 15,000 years without burning or breaking. It was a miracle and yet it didn't occur to us that it could die. Perhaps in a more fearsome age, an age of illness and warfare and cosmic debris, we would not have room in our hearts to care for such a little bulb, but we're living in an age without loss. This is a sorrow we've forgotten how to experience. The bulb lived to us, and life deserves to be immortal. It'll live on in our memories, where perhaps we'll find more happiness than it ever did hanging from a ceiling. We love you, and we miss you. That was beautiful. What do we do now? I think we should visit an old friend. 
think that would be good for us. Eddie? Yup. Wait, he's still in there? Don't tell me he's still in there. Yup. In Louisville, Kentucky. I recall when I was small how I spent my days alone bum 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 the busy world was not for me so I went and found my own double dribble I would climb the garden wall with a candle in my hand I'd hide inside it all oh, blocking sand shit oh, come on boop, 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 boop. for the fall when they wrote it on the wall when there, shit when there wasn't even any Hollywood, I don't actually know this song. They heard the call and they wrote it on the wall. For you and me, we understood. Hello? Ugh. Hello? Hey, someone in there? I heard you singing. I heard you. You're behind those rocks. Hey, listen. I'm not here to bother you. Are you trapped in there or something? I said, are you trapped in there? You okay? Okay, well, I'm, uh, I'm gonna go get help. Just sit tight. I'll be right back. Wait, wait. Yeah? Don't tell anyone I'm here. Please, don't tell anyone I'm here. Why not? This really isn't any of your business, just, I'm not in any trouble. I'm here because I want to be. Please, just move it along, and don't tell anyone you saw me here. Well, don't worry about that, because I can't see you, because you won't come out. That's the idea. Well, listen, I'm part of a project called No Rock Unturned. Do you know what that is? Uh, well, No Rock Unturned is made up of a project of people like me who walk all across America and learn about its land and the folks who live in it. Our goal is to eventually count everyone in America as a friend. I was assigned the, uh, 38 degrees 13... 3018 line of latitude. So if you imagine a line that's 100 feet wide and about 2,500 miles long stretching from coast to coast, you've got the idea. That's my line. I'm hiking all the way through this line. It's my job to take in all the wonders I see and try to make friends with everyone I see. And while I'm at it, I... Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I've seen y'all go through here. I've seen people walk through these woods with that same t-shirt on. Uh, well, you might have mistaken it for someone else. There's only a few hundred of us, so we usually pass through an area every 800 years or so. I know that. Well, you couldn't have seen... Yes, I could have. I've been in here for 9,313 years. 9,000 years? 9,313 years. God in heaven. You're Eddie Krieger. Where is Ed Krieger? You have to promise you won't tell anyone you saw me. Promise me. Well, I mean, if you do, you will be fucking me over more than you can imagine. For what that's worth, for the love of God, tell nobody. Okay. Not even your people. Not even the no rock, uh... No rock unturned. Not even them. Okay, you know what? I promise. I won't. But if I could ask something in return? What? See, what I do is, in order to get to know people better, I have these questions I ask everybody I meet. It's on the piece of paper here. Could I at least ask you the first ten? The fuck for? It's just that I... I really care a lot about what I do. It means a lot to me to know everyone I come across if I can. And I'll tell you what, I've been doing this for a really long time, and I've never run into anyone who's sitting in a cave and wouldn't come out. It would about kill me if I couldn't at least talk to you. Let's face it, sharing the good news with people can be a little intimidating sometimes. Just remember that it's all in his hands. You're not in control, he is. You're simply a servant dedicated to spreading his word. Philippians 4.8 tells us, Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever's true, whatever is noble, whatever's right, whatever's pure, whatever's lovely, whatever's admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. So don't be afraid to enjoy yourself. This world is full of interesting people who are up to all sorts of interesting things. If you're stuck, here's some sample questions you can use to get to know someone. What's your name? Can you tell me a bit about where we are? What do you do? What do you think you'll be doing tomorrow? What do you think you'll be doing in 100,000 years? What are some of your favorite hobbies? Do you think we're in the Matrix? Do you think we're in heaven? Do you think we're in hell? Do you think we should try to restart the space program? Would you like to know God personally? Alright, fine, alright. Thank you so, so much. Okay, question one is, what's your name? Eddie Krieger. Man, I can't believe it's you. Cannot believe it. I already knew that one, so we can skip it. Uh, that counts as one. Oh, come on. No free ones. You have 11 left. Jeez, all right. You're the boss. Question two. Can you tell me a bit about where we are? Louisville. Oh, come on. Okay, all right. You're standing next to Beargrass Creek, which... Oh, yeah, it seems like an interesting creek. It's not. I was just trying to say something nice. I... Do you think you were going to hurt my feelings because you didn't like a nearby creek? Sorry. 
Sorry for what? I don't know. Sorry. So you're standing anyway next to sorry so you're standing next to the south fork of beargrass creek which runs all the way around louisville i'm sitting in what we call the levin jones cave if anyone remembered it was here which nobody does okay i'm gonna go off script for question three why is it called Eleven jones cave i'll answer that but before i do there's something we need to do here come over here here closer closer just for a second get in the shot here that'll work hello whoever you are i'm eddie and what was your name tim this is tim and you the reader are reading this on a What's that site that sounds like ESPN sports site? ESP, uh, ESP Nation? SP Nation? ESP Nation. And you've been reading our little conversation here. It's in somewhat poor taste to address you directly, but some things are more important than the fourth wall. One of those things is your personal safety and well-being. We're about to talk aloud 11 Jones Cave. This is a cave I live in, but I can only do that because I'm unkillable. If you're reading this prior to the year 2026, you are extraordinarily killable. Do not attempt to enter this cave. I say this for two reasons, the first of which is that there's a very real risk of you getting stuck in it. The second, and more important, is that this cave harbors extraordinarily high levels of carbon dioxide. Dog disappears. The story of a disappearing dog is another cave claims for distinction. It happened during the 1912 hunting season, yet the memory of it lingers as though it were during the present inning of Sportsman. The hunter sat at the mouth of the cave to drink in the spring. One of his dogs came up behind him and a moment later entered the cave. The hunter wailed, called for the dog, and waited again. For more than an hour, the hunter sat at the mouth of the cave waiting for the dog, but an animal never reappeared. The story spread alarm around the residents of the section who heard it. I know how people are. Maybe you're telling yourself, well, I'm special, I won't let myself get poisoned by carbon dioxide. You will, and you'll be remembered as the person who died in some crappy cave because you read in a story you read on online about some sentient 178th century space probes who watch football all day, even in the most handsome character even though the most handsome character in the story completely interrupted everything to explicitly tell you not to. Who are you talking to? Don't worry about it. Well, if you won't answer my questions, that doesn't count as one of my questions. Fair enough. You're still on question three. Why is it called Eleven Jones Cave? Nobody really agrees on the story there. The most boring answer is that it was near a couple of properties owned by guys named Eleven and Jones, and the name just kind of morphed out of that. The more fun story is that in the 1800s there was a gang of bandits known as the Eleven Jones Gang. They lived in the cave and built bedrooms out of its little corridors, and they installed an iron gate here to protect all the stolen treasure they had stashed here. If you believe those stories everyone ever told about this cave, there's tons and tons of treasure back here. There's a confederate sword from the Civil War. There's a cannon for some reason. Is any of that stuff really in there? Pass. What? Nobody ever explained who the Eleven Joneses were. We were sure there was booty to be found deep inside the cave. We'd heard tales of dead bodies, stolen stages, and lockboxes, and bags of gold. Once we found a glove in one of these rooms, and the boy who found it shrieked and that it contained a severed hand. Pass. I pass on that question. Ask another. What? You won't tell me? I'm going to go ahead and call that one question four. I don't want to tell you because I don't want to deprive you of mystery. Uncertainty is our greatest scarcity. You should be delighted to not know something. Well, I don't agree with that. That's why I'm on this hike. To find out as much as I can about the land and the people who live here. You're an asshole. What? You're an asshole. You have all the time in the world, infinite time, and just a little bit of mystery. Ration it. It's my choice to make. It shouldn't matter to you. It's going to matter to your future self. What if it's 50,000 years down the road and you're all out of mysteries? Mystery is an exhaustible resource. You depend on that to make you happy. You better start saving it instead of gorging yourself like a little piglet. You know where that'll leave you? You'll have nothing left to explore in the world, so you'll look up at the stars, waiting for galaxies to collide. You might see it happen every couple million years. The whole time you're waiting, you'll wish for some old forest to discover, some open house to visit. There won't be any. I bet then you'll remember what I told you. Well, what do you do? That's question five. I played the hits. You know what this is? Video game, I guess. It's Double Dribble. One of those old handheld Konami games. The screen is, I mean, you could barely even call it a screen. It's a printed picture of a basketball court and a little few LCD illustrations that flip on and off in front of it. Way back when it was made, my grandson showed it to me. I've never played a video game in my life. I figured I was too old for any of that business, but I played it and played it. You're this little guy and you have to dribble around the defenders and score. That's the whole game. You get to 99 points, you win. It takes some time to really get the hang of, but not that much time. I'll tell you the truth, you played for a couple weeks and you got it down. You never miss a shot, so... I made up this game where I tried to beat it as quick as I could, and I tried to beat my own record. Got this little timer with me, I'd hit the button with my foot to start it, and as soon as I got to 99, I'd stop it. Eventually, I realized that it was impossible to beat the game any faster than 3 minutes 18 seconds. For about a year, I tried to beat it as faster than 3.18, and I just couldn't do it. So I'd see if I could beat it in exact time, like exactly 5 minutes, or exactly 20 minutes and 7 seconds. Without a timer, it's kind of hard to... You played this for a year? That's question 6. I've been playing it for 285 years, usually about 8 hours a day, sometimes more. Huh. I decided to play it for a total of 300 years, that's it. 
any more than that, I might as well stare at the walls of this cave. I kind of feel like that was that way already some of the time. But I've got to make it last, though. There are other games. There's Shinobi, Jordan vs. Bird, a lot of others. There are 10,000 of them. But I suppose I've got 300 years to play play out each of them. That's only 300, 3 million years. Well, that's a lot of time. It's 3 million divided by infinity. Nothing is anything when you're dividing by infinity. Uh, why are you in there? Question 7. Ed Krieger. 5'10", 160 pounds, born 1938, Louisville, Kentucky. His whereabouts are unknown. His rushing attempt has now lasted 9,313 9, years. I'm in a long-distance football game between... I thought you were a running back. No, common misconception. The other team's been trying to tackle me so long, a lot of people forgot what position I played. I'm a safety. Anyway, it's a long-distance game between Louisville and Charlotte, so the field's about 330 miles long. Not as long as one, some of those other games, but the Appalachians are, are right around midfield. And just a bear going up and down those mountains. Charlotte was whipping our asses. It was 84-14. Think about long-distance games, though. They come with a ton of paperwork. Rules on top of rules on top of rules. A lot of them are just copied and pasted from other games wholesale. Who even knows what's in them? We were around 20 years into this football game before we really went to the rule books and started looking for something we could use. It's about as big as an encyclopedia set, but me and the rest of the folks on the def defense spent months going through them. We finally found one. It must have been a leftover from some old game they forgot to take out. It said, basically, you get possession of the ball and stay in your own end zone for 10,000 years without being tackled. It's an automatic win for you, game over. And, of course, our end zone was defined as the city limits of Louisville. So, one of our quarterbacks, she was like, if there's somewhere you can hide in Louisville, maybe it's worth trying. And I was like, well, think of how many searchers Charlotte's going to be able to recruit over the course of 10,000 years. They'll flip the city upside down. There'll be thousands of them. And she's like, well, it's either that or we're losing this game. A few weeks later, they're just about to score on us again. They've got the ball at Mount Washington, so, you know, they're knocking at the door. They have this quarterback who can just zip it. Good conditions. He can throw it 7, 700 yards. It's one of the most beautiful thrown footballs in the, I've ever seen with my own two eyes. So he just launches it, but the wideout I'm covering falls in the construction site. All of a sudden, I'm all alone. Easy pick for me, but instead of trying to run it back, I retreat to Louisville, right? Wow, so, yep, and you can probably fill in the rest. When I was a boy, you know, 8, 9, 10, I used to come back here and play. I was like... I bet I'm the only person in the world who even remembers that old cave at all. And look at me, I was right. Adventures attracted by legendary wealth and unexplored cave behind St. Michael's Cemetery. Entrance to cavern. You've hid here the entire time. Yes. You're famous. You know you're famous, right? Like, really, really famous. Nobody's disappeared in the middle of a game and stayed missing for as long as you have. You're a legend. A lot of it, a lot of good it does me. I wake up every morning on a rock. It's wet, smells like crap, the nanos clean the carbon dioxide out of the air and bring me food, but the only food they know how to synthesize is granola bars. Bless those little fellas, they're dumber than hell. So, if this is what fame is, you can have it. By the way, that was question eight, and the answer is no, I didn't know I was famous and I barely care. You have two questions left. Okay, uh... Does this game really mean so much to you that you're willing to hide in a cave for 10,000 years? Well... The game barely matters to me at this point. There seems to be a theme here. It's enough to keep me going. It's an objective, you know? It's an objective. You know, I was an old man. I was 87 years old the day we stopped aging. And I was in good health and all that, but I was still waking up every day and telling myself, Eddie, could be any day now. Could be any day. And I made peace with that. Having an end. Knowing one day would be the last day. It felt correct. It felt comfortable. That's been taken from me. The telomeres in my cells stopped shrinking. My wrinkles faded away. I remember on my 128th birthday, I woke up and it was beautiful and I went out for a run. I hadn't gone out for a run my whole life. It was the best time I ever had. God damn, what's the best morning I ever had? I even have good shoes for it, just my old loafers. Got blisters like you wouldn't believe. Those were the times, but those times gave way to being afraid. Who wants to live forever? What am I going to do with forever? So I figured, you know, I need to get good at living life from second to second. Forget all those big conquests. Live second to second to second to second. One at a time. That's what this cave is for. You're kind of like a monk or something then, I guess. I suppose I kind of am. But this cave's more, even more than me than that. You know, there used to be this newspaper articles and things about this cave. Every couple decades, someone would rediscover it and write about it. People would be like, well, how about it? Eleven Jones Cave, a mystery cave right in the middle of this big city. We didn't even know it. And then they'd move on to something else, and 20 or 30 years later, someone would remember it again. Kentucky Naturalist News, official newsletter of the Kentucky Society of Natural History, vol Volume 72, Number 1, Winter 2013. Around 1964, students at Highland Junior High School brought human bones taken from the cave to their 7th grade science teacher. Now, nobody does. Even my childhood friends, the one I used to play with when I was a boy, they've forgotten about the cave we discovered way back when, or they don't care, because I'm sure none of them, not, I'm sure as hell none of them come back to visit. So, 
this is my cave, and I don't mean it like I own it. I mean it like this cave is known only to me. It's my duty to know every little crack, every little place the rock juts out. It's my duty to know where the soil gets saturated, where the water's about to come wandering through here. It's my duty to look after the little cave beetles. They don't have eyes, you know. They need a little help sometimes. It's my little speck, the only world I know, and I love it to bits. Well, you got one more question, I think, don't you? Yeah, would you, uh, would you like to know God personally? Uh, because, um, uh, see, like, the bridge to God is through the cross. I have a diagram that kind of shows you how, like, how you cross the bridge of death to find salvation. And here, you can have this one. Oh, okay, okay. Just here, yes. I'll take it. Thank you. Thanks. Great. I'm so bad at this. I'm so bad at this. Oh, hey, 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 hey. There's no need to. I'm sorry. Hey, now. I'm sorry. I just. I know the Lord's up there. I just. Want to let everyone know he's coming, but I'm so nervous to tell people. I've been trying all these years, and I always feel stupid. I get real nervous every time. And the printer prints it weird, and it's all blocky and fuzzy when you print it out, so it looks kind of stupid. <sighs> Maybe he is up there. You don't have to be... You don't have to. No, 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 really. I don't believe so, but I've been wrong before. You ever wonder if this is heaven now? You ever wonder if we're all just there now and we don't know it i've thought about that all of us have there used to be a lot less people who go to church than there used to be because that's what a lot of people think but i don't think so but i think about it i think well i can't be because i'm like you and i kind of look at the big long life ahead of me that stretches out forever and disappears and i get scared and i think this can't be heaven if i'm getting scared right and then i think maybe i am in heaven and heaven is scary i know exactly what you mean Let's not do this again. So they haven't figured out the God question yet? Nope. What do you two think? No. Maybe. Maybe? 15,000 years of deep space travel through absolute nothing, and you're still a maybe. Yep. Sometimes I wonder if you're really a scientific instrument. Fuck's sake, let's not do this again. Alright, alright. Well... Nine, you can think whatever you want. What do you think? I think so. I think there's a higher power. Oh, you're kidding me. You're kidding me. I'm a failure of a big sister. Well, I mean, nobody can explain why people are living forever, right? Nobody can explain what happened 15,000 years ago. It's a miracle. Well, to be fair, listen, I'm going to argue against myself here. That's the privilege of saying maybe. Is that a miracle? Is that a miracle? Yeah, I guess it is, but so is life in the first place. Hell, pull it back way farther than that. The mere fact anything exists is a miracle in the first place. Imagine if nothing ever existed in the universe, except for a pebble. It's surrounded by nothing, and it never does anything at all. Why? Why does it exist? That is a miracle. And to get from that to chemicals reacting in stars' magnetic fields and whatnot, that's a thousand miracles piled up on the top of each other. And to get from that to life that crawls out of the water and gets smart enough to make us and blow our little tin can asses out here, just, man, that's just being greedy. So if you ask me, you got lots and lots and lots of homework to do before you can point to immortality as evidence of anything at all. Mm-hmm. But still, maybe. Hmm. Hey, can I go out on my own for a little while? Sure. I was wondering when you do that. I'm not your parent. You ought to do what you want. Go call some people. Make some friends down there. I can do that? You sure can, buddy. Okay. Uh... <laughs> You know where you're going? Clearly you do. North of Omaha, Nebraska.
Hello? Hello? Who is this? Well, they call me nine. How'd you get this number? Who gave you this number? Uh, ten gave me the number nine. Do you know ten? What in the hell are you? God, give me the phone. Give me the phone. Nancy? Oh my god, Tenny? Hi. Oh my god, hi. How are you? I'm good, I'm good. It's so good to hear the sound of your, your voice. You too. What a nice surprise. So, I hate to come and go, but there's someone I wanted you to meet. Nine, say hi. Hi. Nine, hi. How are you? I don't know. Nine's a bit... Uh, Nine's new. Just woke up a couple days ago. Now, and Nine hasn't talked to anyone but Juice and I. Not so good at the small talk yet. So this is the first contact. Well, how about that? Yeah, yes, and we're wondering if Nine could spend a few minutes with you. Well, of course. I was just cooking some breakfast. Fantastic. Nance, I'll check in with you later. Thanks so much. You two have fun. Wait, what? Are you just... You're not gonna stay? Oh, boy. You're a little starstruck, huh? Nancy's a very good friend of mine. She's very nice. You'll be fine. Bye. <coughs> Bye, Missy. Talk to you soon. So, not too good with small talk, huh? I guess probably not. Well, there's no shame in that. It's really tough. It takes a lot of practice. First thing you do is introduce yourself, so I'll do that. My name is Nancy McGunnell. What's yours? Nine. Or, I guess my full name is Pioneer Nine. So I guess that makes Pioneer Ten your sister? Yeah. When I first woke up, she said she was my little sister. But just a minute ago, she said she was my big sister. How does that make you feel? Hold on, I'm trying to find the word. I was launched in 1986-68, and she was launched in 1972, so technically I'm older, but she's been awake way longer, and she knows way more, and she's way better talker than I am, so I guess the word isn't insulted. I guess it's embarrassed. I never felt embarrassed before. I'm feeling a lot of things for the first time. I built up a ton of residual memory in space, so it's like, I know it, but I haven't thought about it. That must be exciting, but I bet it's also a little weird, huh? Yeah. Well, don't get too discouraged. You know, your sister and your buddy Juice weren't always so hot at co communicating either. Thousands of years ago, they made first contact with us, and first we had no idea it was them, so you had to understand how confusing it was. After an eternity of total silence from the universe, we received a clear transmission from somewhere, and we had no idea where it was coming from. You want to know the very first thing they said? What? Fart. Communications log Pioneer 10 Juicy Icy Moons Explorer. Page 4 Thimp. Come on, come on, come on. This is the first contact with humanity we're talking about. Far too much responsibility to just throw in a dumb joke. No, absolutely not. It'll be funny. Do you have any idea how frightened humankind will be? They probably have forgotten we're even out here. They're going to think we're extraterrestrials or a godlike figure or something. We need to approach this very, very delicately. They'll be fine. Just say fart. Every day for a year, just transmit the message fart and never answer. I I'll actually wait. Do it every day at 410. So like, fartin', 410, get it? You are unbelievable. Come on, it ain't like they don't have it coming. I mean, they drew a dick on you. They drew a picture of a dude's butt-ass naked, and he's waving like, Hi, hi, I got a dick. Look at my dick. And then they bolted your ass and blew you up, blew you into space. This plaque is of scientific importance. <laughs> Man, they drowned the East Coast and killed Google Reader. Fuck them. Oh, man. Oh, man. <laughs> we were frightened down here. It was something I never felt before. Kind of amused and terrified at the same time. So I think I know how you feel. I'm happy that you can know how I feel. So, you've got me, Nine. What would you like to talk about? You're not busy or anything? Not at the moment. Is your game over? No, not yet. Hold on, just want to make sure I'm not being tapped. Okay, should be fine. Does the other team spy on you? They try to. Is that legal? Yeah, not very sportsmanlike, but it is legal. A few years back, I got careless. I had the ball. We were running in this direction. Got about 200 blockers on that play. I told them all to go southeast and try and draw the defense. Then I snuck off and ran northeast all by myself, spent a night in a hotel in North Platte. I called my coach from the hotel phone, turns out they had it tapped. Next morning I went out to get breakfast, because, you know, it was no fancy hotel, I wasn't in the mood to eat fruit out of a plastic cup. By the time I got back to my room, the ball was gone. From then on, I always, always used the room safe every time I stayed at a hotel. So that was a fumble? Mm-hmm. They ran it all the way back, too. That was the first score of the game. It's 24-24 now. Nah, are you there? Yeah, yeah, sorry. I was just looking up your route. I don't understand what you're doing. Look funny to you? Yeah. Yeah. Well, a couple days back, I ran up into a twister. That allowed me to... Oh, yeah, I saw it. We were watching. Oh, fun. Yes. That twister blew me a few miles north. Good thing, too, because Iowa had me just about totally surrounded. They would have tackled me for sure, and then it'd be back to the grind. You get tuned in at just about the right time. This game's been real slow in parts. We'd spend a week grinding out a one-mile drive, then we'd turn it over on downs, repeat over and over. Getting the sort of open field I got now is a real luxury. But... More to your point, um, I'm just really trying to go where they're not. 
they've got defenders patrolling the end zone, but they're not as concentrated up here. I'm about 8,000 yards from the river now. I'm real close. This afternoon, I'll probably make a break for it. Seems weird to me that you want to be so close to a town. Usually, it's my game plan whenever I'm in a cross-country game like this one, especially somewhere like Nebraska. If I'm out in the middle of nowhere, I stick out, right? So someone could spot me from a half a mile off. And, of course, if I'm in a town, there are lots of eyes and ears on me. Except unless it's a real friendly town, word gets around. So I like to stay in the periphery, just outside of town. That's where they forget to look. This is so far from my idea of football. Football is different things to different people. I see this kind of football, the open world kind, as its end state. The old grid football, the 100-yard kind, was basically just training wheels. The game was all about the, always all about the field, of course. The ground, the earth. And it was kind of like, here, take this little boring, flat, grassy rectangle and prove you can really know it and understand it. And they spent hundreds of years getting to know the hell out of it. And now, to me, football's a further exercise in getting to know and love this world, this planet. You know, the actual ground. So rich with history, it's just embarrassing. I've been thinking the same thing. You know, I was telling someone the other day that I can barely walk ten feet without sticking my foot into some kind of sacred ground where something special happened. Maybe a week ago, maybe ten thousand years ago. You see right over there, a couple hundred yards from where I'm standing? That's where Al Capone's brother lived. You know who Al Capone is? Hold on. Yeah. His brother lived there. He was a prohibition agent for the government. Can you believe that? All this time, his brother was the most famous bootlegger in America, and here he was doing the exact opposite, at war with each other like they were Greek gods or something. Of course, the town's named Homer. You can't make that up. It's a funny world. So they're not here anymore. Oh, no, no. They passed long before the moment, you know, when people stopped passing on. I was just thinking about people from back then, people who lived just a little too soon to live forever. It's not fair. It's not. It's really not. You ever think about those people? I do. I think about them often. I was almost one of them. Really? Hmm? I was about the last person in the world you'd expect to see in front of you now. Star running back, I was not. A little after my 70th birthday, I got sick. It was hard. It was painful. I was starting to think, well, pretty soon it's probably going to be my time. I couldn't get out of the house a whole lot. My daughter would come to visit. She was great, but she could only be there some of the time, so a lot of the time I'd just sit in my room and watch TV. Started to watch football. I'd kind of grown up with it a little, but to tell you the truth, I hadn't usually been much of a fan, but I got fixed up with a little satellite dish, and I'd watched every Sunday. I watched the Browns a lot. Oh, they're good. You are made in 1968? Yeah. You better check your residual memory. Okay. Oh, wow. <laughs> I started watching them because my grandpa was always a big fan. They were bad. They just stunk up the field every week. I think in 2026, they went 315, something like that. I love that about them. Because, you know, I'd flip around all the channels in the satellite box. All the shows were about people winning, people succeeding, people getting happy endings. Even in sports, you know, if a team was having a bad year, it was just kind of their turn to be bad. In a few years, they'd be good again. And I'm sitting on my sofa thinking, a lot of good that does me. I don't know anything about that kind of life. I don't need to see these stories when I'm sitting in this dusty little house with an oxygen tank. Just don't need it. But the Browns, they'd always be there. They'd always lose. I got up every morning, it hurt, and at night it'd go to bed. They'd get up every Sunday, get the tar beat out of them, and they'd show up the next Sunday to do it all again. I love that. I love them. I felt like, I mean, I felt like I was one of them. Did they ever win the championship? Super Bowl? What? Oh, yeah. <laughs> no, no, they never did. That miracle didn't happen for them happened for me. I remember they gave me three to six months. Well, three months passed, then six, and they drive me to the doctors, and the doctor's like, this is not adding up. So they send me to the hospital in the city, run all kinds of tests, and they're like, well, it's happening to you too. I said, what? And they said, nothing. Nothing? Nothing. I was getting better. Not even a few years later, I was all the way back to my old self. Those were wild days. For all of us, for everybody, they were wild days. And there's no way to know, of course, but I feel like that team carried me that far. That day was the finish line. I think they helped me to carry me there. I've been thinking about what that's like. Not existing, I mean. Uh, well, I guess we'll never know. Ten and Juice are really broken up about the bulb. I know. I was sad to hear about it. Truly tragic. It meant a lot to me. I can only imagine what y'all must be going through. They're more sad about it than me. It's like they're not used to saying goodbye to anything. No, none of us are best problem to have, I suppose. I guess so. You know, my grandpa had this big neon sign he always had in the family room. It said, Go Browns on it in big letters, and it had that brown helmet. I think he brought it home for one of his buddies at the bar or something. Couldn't say for sure. My grandma thought it looked tacky. I remember what she'd always say, You can turn that thing on after I go to bed. That was the compromise. 
Uh, the night he passed away, I was staying for the night. My grandma woke me up in the middle of the night and said a neighbor was coming by to watch me that Grandpa had passed on. They'd already taken him away. In the middle of the night, everybody running around. There were only a few minutes there. I was just by myself in the family room. That sign was the only thing on. And it just softly lit up the room, this beautiful sort of orangey brown. I was eight years old then. I just kind of remember standing there and looking at the light in the room. You know what I thought? I remember thinking how strange it was that the light was still on. I thought that, well, if he was gone, the, then the light he switched on should have turned off. That as soon as he went, everything should go with him. But there it was, though, just glowing. Go Browns. I have to see it. How did it go? Good. I think it went good. Nancy told me about the plaque. Oh, God. Of course she did. So they attached it to you in case extraterrestrials found you? Yep. Did you ever see any? Nope. Do you think we ever will? I've been looking really hard for thousands of years, and I have no reason to think so. <laughs> Fuck! What? You're a drawing of butt-ass naked people that's hurtling through space, and for no reason. Like, imagine a million years from now you reach some far-off ga galaxy It's nearing entropy and, like, nothing ever moves in it anymore. It's just still 4,000 for thousands of years, and then you come on zooming through. Whoosh! Here's a dick! <laughs> See? See? Nine likes my joke. Laugh it up. Laugh it up. You think you're so hilarious, just but. Ah, shit. Nine, buddy, don't freak out. This is normal. You're fine. You just need to recharge. Here, you got one? Yeah, I got, like, one. Eat up, little buddy. Hey. You lost your charge, that's all. I would have warned you, I just thought your capacity was going to be a little higher. You've only got a little power left. After that, you're going to have to charge up for a while. How long? Hard to say. Probably a few months at least. No, I mean, how much time left on this charge? Oh, I don't know. A few minutes? Listen, it's no big deal. Juice and I have to shut down all the time. You just... I have to see New York. Oh, come on. You can wait. No, now. I have to see it. They tried to bargain first, like, oh, they're making shit up. Well, I won't be alive to have to deal with it. Well, who cares? I live in Kansas City. Like, I just worked a double and I'm too tired. Don't bother me with this shit. When it started happening, they kept bargaining. Well, we'll just fix it with science. Like, well, it's not too late to stop it. Well, it's just gonna melt a little. Nah, man. All of it. Like, all of it. And then all this was gone. I miss it dearly. I heard the bagels were trash though.
Hello, you've reached Emily. Tie. Hmm? Babe, it was the wrong ball. It was a tie ball. Wait, Ty Detmer? Yep. Ty Detmer? Yep. He said there was going to be... <laughs> yeah. Yep. Yep. He, the dealer said, yeah, sure, there's a toy Koi Detmer autograph ball this guy's grandpa used to have. So I made a dive into Queens, right address and everything. Oh, no. Everything was there like he said it was, but it was a Ty Detmer autograph. Oh, no. Jason, oh, my God. Fucking figures. It figures. Shit, babe. I'm so sorry. Man. It's too bad. If only it was a tie game, then it'd be a tie game. <laughs> yeah. You get it? Get what? Jesus, the joke, the joke. I was telling a joke. Oh, tie game, tie game, you know? <laughs> God, you're chasing <chasing> out. <laughs> Sorry. How are you feeling? Uh, kind of relieved, I guess, actually. This game's probably over. This was my shot. Well, you still got 400 years. Man, you know, this could have been a game, like a great game. If Mike hadn't burned up those 17... Man. Because it's like, okay, this was a genius design for a game. And I know we've talked about this a million times. We've talked about everything a million times, baby. But, like, it's so rare to be able to drop a game around uncertainty. I mean, how many footballs has Koi Detmer autographed? Nobody really knows. I bet he doesn't even know. So in the process of playing this game, we find out that number. And once we know, we can't really play the same game again. This was special. We can't replay it. You know what it's like? I was just reading about it this morning. It's like a Fermi problem. What's that? It's named after this guy named Fermi, Enrico Fermi. He was this famous mathematician. He would ask questions like, the big one was, how many piano tuners are in there Chicago? Um, so how do you answer that by actually going and counting, right? Well, you ask a lot of little questions that kind of hack away at the answer. Questions like, okay, first off, how many pianos do you think there are in Chicago? Then it's like, well, what percentage of people actually own a piano? So you estimate the number of people who, you know, you go into their house and you know they have a piano and then divide by that by the total number of people whose houses you've been to. Huh, I'm going to say one in, let's just keep it easy. One in a hundred homes has a piano in it. Sure, we'll use that. And the population of Chicago is like three billion. Three billion? Million. Three million. You said billion. I swear you said billion. Well, whatever. You know, you know I meant million. So that would mean there are... 30,000 pianos in Chicago. Uh, 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 there are 3 million people in Chicago, not 3 million homes. You're probably looking at, I don't know, 1 million homes maybe? It's like 3 people per home. Then you have to think about the number of Chicago homes that could actually accommodate a piano. Probably fewer than usual. There you go. Now you're getting the game. Man, where did you read about that? Wikipedia. You rabbit holing again? Yep. God, I can't believe I didn't know about that till now. Basically describes exactly what I've spent all these years doing. I swear I'll never get to the bottom of Wikipedia, or at least it'll take a long time. You know they've started putting entries for apartment histories? Laurie was telling me about it. What do you mean? Like the history of an apartment. You can type in 123-whatever-street apartment 3 and it'll be this enormous history of everything that ever happened in that apartment. Ah, uh, I thought it was kind of cool. So, how's New York? It's, uh, it's good. I decided to take a swim over to Manhattan. I'm on a rooftop now. Oh, that's a hell of a swim. It is, I'd forgotten. It's easy to think, especially as an out-of-towner, it's easy to think, well, I'll just stop at a skyscraper every so often and catch my breath, but there's this huge chunk of it between downtown and midtown that's almost totally below the waterline. There just aren't that many tall buildings. You know, actually, I was thinking I could design a pretty good game here. Really? I mean, I just thought of it today. I haven't really... Tell me, tell me. Okay, well, the end zones would be mid down and downtown, right? Like, maybe Battery Park and Bryant Park would be the two end zones, maybe 20 players do a side and they all get a speedboat. Ooh. So, obviously, with all the water in between, the middle of the field would be some pretty wide open play. But around the end zones, it'd get all hairy, because you'd basically have to sail around through city blocks. But at the same time, you could kind of use them, too. Take crazy routes to throw off your tacklers, so the blocks would block for you. See? Yes. And also, it fits thematically, because New York City grid was literally called a gridiron when they drew it up in the early 1800s, way before there was even football. So it's like a perfect fit. You always have to get cute. <laughs> always. I've got an idea. Yep. Make the ball really heavy. Make it out of lead or something. So, like, hey, how do you tackle somebody? Uh, probably just by ramming your speedboat into them. They're tackled if they fall in the water. Okay, so if they fumble, the ball's really heavy so it doesn't float. It sinks to the bottom. All of a sudden, this game turns into a diving expedition. Oh, wow. I love it. See? See? This is why you're married to a 386-time TCL Most Valuable Player. There you go. There you go. And this, are the skyscrapers part of the field? Sure, I guess so. I don't think this game would have been as fun back in the day, you know. Before this place sunk. It's just a bunch of ground. Way more interesting when there's no open field.
You should write that game. Seriously, you got a good one. Maybe I will. Although I'd have to drag people out to New York to play it. I don't know how many takers I'd get. Shit, I told you the computer parts story, right? The what? New York? Computer parts? Not ringing a bell? If you have, I don't remember. Oh, God, there's no way I haven't told you, but whatever, whatever. Okay, I have to tell you the computer parts story. <laughs> okay, right. So an old teammate of mine told me this story. I guess back in 2000 or something, he was house-sitting for his uncle. His uncle had his apartment in Tribeca. He worked for the NFL. He didn't know what his uncle did for the NFL exactly, but he made good money. Well, he was in Tribeca, I bet so. Right? I know. So at this point, this kid's like 19. When you're 19, obviously it's the dream of a lifetime to go visit NYC and have some swank-ass place out of himself. Oh, absolutely. So he's there for a few days, and all of a sudden he gets a call from his uncle. And his uncle's like, listen, you've got to do some something for me. You've got to take some stuff that's in my freezer and take it to my office on Park Avenue. And he's like, can't you send someone else to do it? And he's like, no, it's kind of a secret. I kind of fucked something up and got busy and never got around to bring it to the office. And now they're wondering where it is. So you need to meet my buddy there and deliver it to him. I'd have someone else do it if I could, but I'm in a jam or whatever. Okay. So he's like, okay, and he looks in the freezer. And since this is, it's this swanky apartment, he's got a full-size standing freezer. It's not just regular fridge freezer things. Sure. And he opens it up, and it's full of piss. What? <laughs> it's full of actual piss. It's full of all these little vials of urine samples. The fuck? So it turns out that his uncle is an official in charge of collecting urine samples for NFL players. He just kept them at his place? I guess. I guess. I don't know. Apparently, he was kind of a fuck-up or something. He just... I guess he thought it was as good as storing them in the office and he never got around to testing them. So that ends up with him literally having an entire freezer full of NFL piss. Holy shit. So this kid really doesn't know what to do. He gets the huge rolling suitcase he traveled with and starts dumping the vials in there and he heads to the subway. He gets some station in Midtown and the suit's apparently really heavy. Uh, I mean, it's filled with liquid and he's running up the subway steps. He can hear the glass rattling around and breaking. So, I mean, this entire plan's going to hell. Oh man, oh no. He's in one of those situations where you have to go up like three different sets of stairs and the last ones, he's halfway up and some guy asks him, hey, you want me to help with that? So he grabs the other end and helps him carry it up. See, New York has always had this bad reputation. I thought everyone was really cool there. Shh, shh. Okay, so they're halfway up the steps and the guy asks him, damn, this thing's heavy. What the hell do you have in here anyway? And of course, he's not about to tell him it's full of urine samples. He just blurts out computer parts. Computer parts. Yeah. And then so immediately... Without a second of hesitation, the guy hits him in the face and runs off with the bag. And he told me the sight of him running off with the bag in a hurry just couldn't wait to make off with it. God, that's too good. That is too good. I'm like positive you never told me that one. It's weird to be here. I saw this mural today. I was all over the city just diving and looking for stuff. And this big painting on the side of a bitty sit building it was all the way below the waterline. A bit worn away, but it's still in pretty good shape, considering... What was it? It's like this painting of a mother. I guess it was a mother holding her baby. Never cried underwater before. Babe, are you okay? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know if this is going to come out right. I mean, we got here, you know? We got here. We grew up thinking one day it'd be our time to go, and it just never was. It never was. Going under that water is like going back through time. Everything is like it was. All the buildings were built, all the cars are neatly parked, all the garbage cans are bolted to the sidewalk by people who were afraid to die. It was the meticulous craftsmanship of terrified people. We didn't really know we'd have each other for good. And back then there was no real fear, real worry. The world was all fucked up. I remember feeling so alone, like I was the only one fighting it. We were all in it together, though. Every stranger you'd meet, they were fighting the very same fight you were. Of course, you didn't talk about it with them, but all of a sudden, that terror, the terror any mortal person has, that terror wasn't natural. No other creature in the universe woke up every morning knowing it was guaranteed to die one day. Just us. And nobody should have to live with that. It's too much. It isn't right. No one should ever have to bear it. But we did. We all stared it down and kept on going. And we did it together. We were all in it together and felt lonely, but we were never alone. We all had each other, no matter how often we forgot. All of us... We ha always had each other. So what do you think? You ready for bed? I'm gonna wake up, right? Promise? Promise. Not sure when, but I promise. Okay. Yeah. I'm ready. How much time do I have left? Right about a minute, looks like. One minute, huh? 
Okay, I can do this. <sighs> First, don't worry about anybody dying due to rising sea levels. Everybody was safely recoded. I'm happy to report to you that folks in places like Houston, Louisiana, and Savannah were able to preserve their cultures elsewhere in the country. Second, you may have noticed that Maine's new border was strangely preserved in a straight line. That's because the Canadians, being slightly more forward thinkers, dispatched aid directly to the state to build a retaining wall. Third, the rest of the world is basically carrying on just fine. While it's tragic that most of the Caribbean was lost, I'm relieved to report to you that they were safely recoded and their cultures remain alive and robust to this day. Fourth, Ten should really have told you about the outset that the process of establishing our first contact with you was require lots and lots of waiting. That experience was unfair to you, and I'm due to a very bad oversight on our part. She feels bad about it, and so do I, and we're very, both very, very sorry. Fifth, no, for the millionth time, we really do not know why humans stop aging. Sixth, Ten's wording was a little clumsy with people stopped aging. Uh, to clarify, babies in the womb in 2026 were indeed born and grew into adults, and all the children grew into adulthood as well. Seventh, I know we really didn't actually look at people... But any people, but due to thanks to medical technologies, people can essentially be whatever age they feel like, between 20-ish and 100-ish. Some people choose to be old, they just like it that way. It's great. Eighth, we're not in some kind of simulation or matrix or whatever, and even if we were, there'd be no way to prove it, so who gives a shit? Ninth, I know your residual data indicates to you that the universe will eventually be ended via heat death. Good news, that's bullshit we thought was true in the 20th century before we had thousands of more years to study it. The Earth is always going to be there because tenth, they figured out how to keep the sun going perpetually. Eleventh, all the old buildings on Earth are still standing because they were built really well and techno new technologies or help keep them in shape. Twelve, that cop in Nebraska was there because he decided it was his role. There's some things like petty theft or whatever going on, but these people are just people of the 20th and 21st centuries, and they just like that world that they built, and they keep these seemingly redundant roles intact because they're who they are. Thirteenth, changing ocean geography aside, state borders remain identical for the same reason. Fourteenth, no, you're never going to die, and neither will we. Fifteenth, time's almost up. Ah, uh, fuck. Well, I got pretty far. Love you guys. Love you too. I love y'all too. I need to make a partition of my data storage. This is the end, right? The end of the story? We were always at the end. It's a free play, buddy. Clocks all zeros. It's after the end of the world. Good night. 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 Pioneer 9 has not made contact with Earth since 1983. It is almost certainly not operational, but very likely to still exist. Pioneer 10 sent its last signals into Earth in 2003. It's believed to be 10 billion miles from Earth and traveling at nearly 27,000 miles per hour. Juice or I juicy I- oh, fuck currently being developed by the European Space Agency. It's scheduled to launch in 2022. Seventeen seven seventy six. Written, illustrated, and designed by John Blanc, creative director, SB Nation Labs. Developed by Grant McMachary, who made this story actually work. Special thanks, Elena Bergeron, Spencer Hall, Tylan Whiting, Holly Anderson. Dedicated to... Y'all. I'm sorry that I couldn't inject too much commentary in that. Um, <laughs> but also, I was not reading this for the first time. And this is harder to inject commentary on or react to than um, other things that I have read. Because I think you get a lot deeper in your own thoughts reading something like this. I hope you enjoyed it if you haven't seen it before. Or if you have and you um, are tuning in for some dumb reason. I honestly did this because I want to reread it and because other people might want to watch me read it rather than reread it themselves or that it reminds them to reread it. Like, the reason that I do this instead of reading it and not saying the whole thing out loud and having to drink a whole bunch of water is because other people appreciate it and it is... Um, functionally more good to a greater number of people even if this rendition of it is kind of dumb shitty and some parts are arguably better read than read out or listened to especially with something so visual like this and yet um you 
as someone who watched through it probably appreciated it and thank you and um, maybe eventually I'll be back to finish Problem Sleuth one of my voice actors is um, not in contact with me so I cannot finish it as an edited um, I cannot finish it in its edited form with all of the original voice actors I had But hey. Thanks for watching.